Bill, can you hear me? Yes. I can't hear you. So I just want to do a sound check um, before we get too far in. Let's see that you're muted, but I can't. You can hear me? I can hear you fine. But you can't. Yes, I hear you. I still cannot hear you. Do you see the button next to mute below your screen? Try again, Phil. Uh, how's this doing? Very okay. good. No, it's a problem. You can hear me? Yes. All right. Coordinating a Yeti speaker and a Hewlett Packard. Uh, speaker. So I believe I believe we're good. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's conference, sponsored by Thomas More College and the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture. I'm William Fahey, the president of Thomas More College and of the Center, and I'd like to take just a few minutes to welcome everyone talk about this afternoon's conference and um, buy a little bit more time for our other speakers to arrive. And for all those who are tuning in today, we have over a thousand people um, who have registered for the conference, allowing them time to check in. So hopefully everyone can hear well. Thomas More College um, doesn't regularly run Zoom seminars or Zoom conferences. The age of COVID, I think, has ushered in for everyone some interesting changes. So this afternoon, we have a wonderful group of speakers that will be with us and a very stimulating panel. I'd like to tell you a little bit first about Thomas More College and the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture. Thomas More College was founded in 1978. It is a independent Catholic college, a liberal arts college in New England within the great books tradition. Its mission is to provide a solid Catholic education to students of all faiths who are united in their quest for what is true, good, and beautiful and to form them so that they go forward into the world and they, they share their learning with the world joyfully. The Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture is a project of Thomas More College, started a number of years ago by my friend, Philip Lawler and myself. And the Center sees its role as acting as a witness to the Christian faith in New England in particular, but as an example for the entire United States to demonstrate how Christians should remain engaged and active in the public arena. We look to our patron, our founding patron, St. Thomas More for our model and the center concentrates on education, culture, the authentic teachings of the church, civic life and family life. And this afternoon's conference, I think hits upon most of those. I'd like to make a few remarks about the summit and um, and I have to beg your forgiveness for the occasional pauses since I am getting communications from about three or four different media at once um, and trying to adjust accordingly to keep all my masters happy. So today's conference is a summit in response to another summit that you may have heard about. It was a summit that was originally to be held at Harvard Law School in the middle of June, entitled Homeschooling, Problems, Politics, and Prospects for Reforms. This was organized by Professor of Law at Harvard, Elizabeth Bartholet, and James Dwyer, who's a Professor of Law at William and Mary. Um, this was a closed conference, uh, invitation only, and it was aimed at setting forth principles and um, policy action to limit homeschooling throughout the United States. 
I want to be uh, very clear that this summit of Thomas More College is not meant to be a criticism of Harvard directly. We all know that larger institutions don't have complete control over all the things that go on within their institution. And Harvard is a very large institution. Phil Lawler is a graduate of Harvard. I number among family members, former students and friends, graduates of Harvard. In no way is, is this summit implying that Harvard has a position on homeschooling. If it does have a position on homeschooling, ironically, it's a fairly positive position. If you go to Harvard's um, admissions web page, you'll see that they have a whole section dedicated to homeschoolers where they proudly profile some homeschoolers that have attended Harvard. But Professor um, Bartholet and her colleagues have published their views on homeschooling. And it's those views that our speakers this afternoon are going to engage. Those views, generally speaking, uh, reduce the child to a citizen and see education as an extension of the activity of the state. And in a way, it makes a kind of logical sense that Professor Bartholet concludes as she does that the homeschooling movement is a great threat to the state. Because if you place the state prior to the family, then anything that calls into question the state's ability to form citizens is a problem. And so she has written and her summit was originally designed to promote a view that would severely limit, if not make illegal, homeschooling throughout the United States. This model is curious. It would put the United States on par with um, other countries that deny homeschooling, such as Cuba and North Korea and Bosnia, but also some democracies such as Germany and Sweden. Our speakers this afternoon will address the conference from a number of angles, but I think they are all united with me in being very concerned about the summit that would have occurred at Harvard Law School and its strong recommendation that there be a presumptive ban on all homeschooling. I would like to um, simply end by thanking all of you for registering. We're very uh, moved that so many people registered. And I would like to thank all of our speakers this afternoon who um, are quite generous with their time. Thomas More College is independent. We don't have vast resources. And so our speakers simply join with us in being concerned and are helping us provide this conference to all of you for free. I'd like to also thank uh, the unseen invisible Dominic Casella, um, my colleague here at the college who, who is overseeing all the technical work to make this happen. And my friend and colleague, Phil Lawler, who has done quite a bit of work arranging for the speakers. Michael Gillerin, one of our trustees, who has provided incredible support over the last few weeks. And most especially my wife, Dr. Amy Fahey, who was the first one who envisioned the idea of holding a summit um, simply so that people could learn a different point of view on homeschooling and how homeschoolers contribute to the common good and help build up a strong, moral, vibrant, intelligent culture. And so at this point, I'll hand things over to Phil Lawler, who will uh, introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, William. <clears throat> and I second all of your thanks to the people who helped this put this together. Robert George, Professor Robert George, our first guest, is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He has served as Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and before that, the President's Council on Bioethics, and as a Presidential Appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. A graduate of Swarthmore, he holds degrees from Harvard and from Oxford, and he has been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. When we had the idea, when Dr. Amy Fahey had the brilliant idea 
of a conference that would be a bit of a counter to the Harvard Law Conference. Our first thought was to have Professor George here to help families that are homeschooling, parents who are homeschooling, or those who are friends of homeschoolers, clarify their thinking on not simply the benefits of homeschooling, with which I think most are already well aware, but also the philosophical underpinnings of homeschooling, and particularly the underpinnings for the rights of the parents as the primary educator. And so, uh, Professor George, I'd like to ask you, how do parents, how should parents be thinking about defending that important right against state encro encroachment? Hello, Phil. Yes, good to see you. <laughs> yes, can you see me? Uh, just barely, yep, now you're coming into view. Good, uh, uh, it just came on and when it uh, came on, it cut out your voice. So I heard that very kind introduction you gave of me, uh, but I didn't hear the specific question that you uh, began oh. with. How should parents and friends of homeschooling be thinking about defending the philosophical basis for parental rights in education? Yes, well, I think the way to begin is by understanding that at the foundation of parents' rights, and parents' rights are real, and parents' rights are important, and parents' rights need to be respected. But at the foundation are parents' responsibilities, parents' duties. In fact, parents have rights, including the fundamental right acknowledged by our Supreme Court to direct the upbringing and education of their children because they have a responsibility to do that and to do that to the best of their ability. Uh, these are not the sorts of rights that we associate with uh, me generation uh, lifestyle liberalism. This is not me, me, me stuff. It's not all about my satisfaction and uh, achieving my goals and doing what I want to do. It's about the responsibility to bring up as best we can responsible young men and women to be adults who can lead successful lives and be good contributing, honest, decent members of, of society. So yes, by all means, let's speak of parents' rights and let's defend parents' rights, but let's remember that the rights are grounded in parental responsibility. Now, why do parents have responsibility? Why not the state? I think that's the fundamental question here. It is. So, uh, children are not born into a state. They're born into a family. Uh, look right in the center of your belly. You got a reminder there, the great uh, Leon Cass, uh, one, of my, one of my mentors under whom I served on the President's Council on Bioethics, used to urge people to occasionally have a look at the belly button because it reminds you of something very important. That is, you had a mother you didn't come into the world by your own uh, actions. Uh, you had a mom and there was a dad somewhere there in the picture. You're born into families. We do not come into the world, in other words, to borrow a phrase now from uh, Professor Michael Sandel of Harvard, as unencumbered selves, as tabula rasa. We come into the world already encumbered, as it were, with relationships, we come in with mother and father and grandma and grandpa and sometimes brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, we come in as families. Often we're born into a family that has a faith. We're born into a tradition of faith. That's part of who we are from the very beginning. Now, it may be someday we choose as adults to cast off our family, to leave our family, have nothing to do with them. We may lose our faith or change our faith or abandon our, our faith, but we come in already as encumbered selves, parts of communities, including very often communities of faith. And this is why, for example, if we can move out of the Christian context, just to look at a very important issue for the Jewish community, this is why uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters are so insistent to fight for the right of male infant 
circumcision. There's a large movement now worldwide, including in our own country, uh, to forbid male infant circumcision on the ground that it is a violent act against an innocent little boy. Well, you can see that there's a profound philosophical difference there between the so-called intactivists who would deny the Jewish community uh, the right to have their little boys uh, circumcised at eight years old and initiated into the covenant with Abraham. You'll understand there's a profound difference in worldview between what they see when they look at that child that's born, an, an encumbered self, a child born into a family, a Jewish family, a family with a tradition, a family with a, with a faith, and the worldview of the intactivists, the critics, those who would use the law, use the state to ban male infant uh, circumcision. When they see a baby born, they don't see a baby with any relationships that matter, that are fundamental, that are deeper than anything uh, the state can claim. They see an unencumbered self, a potential future chooser who should be uh, allowed to grow up and decide at 18 years old whether he wants to be circumcised or not, initiated into the covenant. These are radically different worldviews, radically different philosophies. And it comes down to whether we're encumbered selves or not, whether it matters that we're born into the family. If it does matter that we're born already into those relationships, as, as I believe it does, as the Jewish community believes it does, as the Christian community believes it does. Uh, uh, even ancient thinkers believed in the pagan world uh, that it does. Then we have start, started to put our, we're starting to put our finger on the sense in which it is right and true and critical to say that the family is prior to the state. The family has responsibilities and therefore authority and therefore rights to direct the upbringing and education of children that the state simply does not have. The state therefore has no right to veto those decisions made and exercise of that responsibility and duty to direct the upbringing of the children. So if the state wants to come in and say, we're gonna take this baby away from this Jewish family because we don't want that baby to be circumcised and a Jewish family would have its baby, its little boy uh, circumcised then we need to say, no, that's not the state's role. That's not the state's business. The family is prior to the state. It's the family that's got the responsibility to make that decision. And that decision may not be vetoed by the state. Now, we all know that there are limits to the authority of families. There are things that are just plain wrong that families ought not to be able to do. And when they do them, the state is right to interfere and even in extreme cases to take a child away. We all know about abuse. This is one of the things that Professor Bartholet at Harvard and her colleagues are, are worried about. Uh, and that's for real. And uh, abuse cannot be tolerated. And there is a role for the state to step in. Uh, we refer to that role, Phil, as subsidiary. It's not primary. The primary role is with the family. But the state has a subsidiary role to assist families and churches and other religious communities in the upbringing and education of children, a subsidiary role to assist those who have the primary role. But things go wrong when that becomes a pretext for the state to exercise not a subsidiary role, but to usurp the authority of parents who have the primary role. And of course, that's the great fear that uh, many of us had, I think rightly have, uh, when we read about the sorts of uh, things that Professor Bartholet and her colleagues have in mind. So yeah, we're right to be worried about abuse, but I'd like to hear the same concerns about abuse going on in the public schools. Of course. Just as families can abuse their responsibilities, families can abuse children, things can go badly when irresponsible parents misbehave toward their children, the same can happen in schools. Would the Harvard uh, conferees tell us that, well, because sometimes bad things go on in schools, abuse happens in schools, sexual abuse happens in schools. We should therefore close the public schools, shut them down. Somehow I don't think so. Well, the same argument applies in the other direction. We must right. not allow people to use the reality of abuse, which must be combated and where the state must step in to become a pretext for the usurpation of parental authority by the state. When you speak of 
the view of individuals, uh, of unencumbered individuals. Encumbrance might be seen in many cases as blessings. You know, the encumbrance of your family is a blessing. And are we sometimes seeing uh, a clash between those two views, the views of the autonomous self in which any encumbrance, any relationship is a potential encumbrance and the view that all of these relationships are, should be viewed as, as blessings. You've hit the nail right on the head, Phil. Uh, the fact that we're born into families, the fact that we're born to a mother, the fact that there's a father uh, in, our, in our background and, and one would hope in our lives, uh, those are encumbrances. We, they are what make us encumbered selves, but not in any uh, negative sense in principle. Now you can have a bad mother, you can have a bad father, they can be negative, but they're also, and in most cases, I think it's fair to say a blessing. We really shouldn't want it to be any other way because human beings are built for, are made for life in community beginning with the community of the family, spreading out to the extended family, including the, the community of faith, including other uh, communities, what we call subsidiary communities uh, that assist families and churches and other communities of faith in uh, the uh, upbringing and education of children. Schools, uh, including public schools for those parents who choose to educate their children in public schools. Those schools are subsidiary institutions that can be helpful. That The Latin, as you know, subsidium means help, to help. Uh, they're, they're meant to be helpful to the family that has the primary responsibility, but it's important to keep things in proper alignment. We don't want what is secondary to be treated as primary and what is primary to be treated as secondary. Parental authority and obligation are foundational. Uh, other authority is derivative. It's meant to be helpful to parents and, and families. Parental authority is not derivative. Children are born into, they're parts of families from the very beginning. That relationship, that natural relationship is there. The state is secondary, it's subsidiary. It's the authority is derivative. It doesn't mean it's real, uh, not real, it, it is real doesn't mean that the state sometimes must step in, the state sometimes must step in. I've already given you some examples of, of where it's the case. But again, the worry is, let's not let that become a pretext for, uh, for usurpation. The cult of the autonomous self, what the late great governor of Pennsylvania, the late Robert P. Casey, not the current senator, he's a different character altogether. His father, the great uh, pro-life governor of Pennsylvania, Robert uh, P. Casey, uh, used to refer to um, the, this uh, philosophy of the autonomous self that's so dominant, especially in elite sectors of society, as the cult of the imperial self. And boy, Phil, he hit the nail on the head. That's exactly right. It's like a religion. It's a cult. It's a cult of the imperial self, the unencumbered self, the so-called autonomous uh, self. But at the end of the day, of course, that self is not autonomous. Uh, it can't even behave as if it's autonomous because it's under the authority of the state. And when we eliminate the authority of the family or the church or the religious uh, community and other institutions of civil society, those mediating institutions that uh, provide the buffer between the individual and the state, then the lonesome autonomous individual is exposed to state power with no protection. Now you're completely under the thumb of the state. And before right. long, things begin to look like some of those regimes that, uh, that uh, Mr. Fahey talked about, uh, that we would not want to come to resemble those regimes that don't allow homeschooling like Cuba and North Korea. What are the legitimate interests of the state in education? The state wants its citizens to be literate, to be able to read and write. Uh, wh where does one draw the line of what What's legitimate in state authority over education? Well, uh, the so-called police powers of states, Phil, uh, extend to public health, safety, and morals, and the general uh, common good. Uh, the state is legitimately concerned about public health. We're, we're talking in the middle of a, of a, of a pandemic, uh, a crisis created by the coronavirus. Uh, 
the state is legitimately concerned about that and it can do things including restricting liberties and restricting important liberties. There are limits. Uh, it's got to be done legitimately. Uh, it, 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 it can't be done uh, arbitrarily or preferentially, but there are things the state can do to protect public health in the same way it can protect the health of children if parents become a threat to children's health or do not take sufficient care of the physical health of uh, children so that they are uh, in danger of severe uh, illness. Same with, same with safety. If parents are uh, letting uh, children do things that are very, very dangerous, very, very unsafe, uh, sometimes the state has to come in and say, no, you know, or can't allow you to allow your children to take those kinds of, of uh, risks. Um, those, are, those are legitimate. You're also right that states legitimately are concerned with their, 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 uh, with their citizens, in, including those who are being brought up to be citizens of the state, being literate, being able to uh, look after themselves such that they will not become burdens on the state unnecessarily. Um, so insisting that children get some basic education, learning to read and write, uh, learning to do ba basic ar arithmetic, putting themselves in a position where, they're, they're, where they will be uh, capable of taking care of their own economic needs, uh, forming families of their own, bringing up children of, of their own. But here we have to be careful. We must not insist that education must be the same for everyone or for every child. And here the Supreme Court gave us a case in 1972 called Yoder against Wisconsin, which is very instructive. The old order Amish community in Wisconsin objected to having their children um, uh, be required to go to school, be educated uh, beyond, I believe it was eighth grade. You can check me on that, but I believe it was eighth grade. In other words, uh, they objected to their children going to high school. Uh, their reasons for that in their community was they were concerned that uh, advanced education would lead to selfishness and worldliness and apostasy uh, and would be damaging for their children as uh, old order Mennonite Amish uh, people uh, and would in the end uh, lead to the destruction of their, of, of their community. Children would be in effect indoctrinated in ways that would um, uh, cause them to want to, to leave their community. The Supreme Court upheld the right of the parents against the state of Wisconsin, which wanted to enforce its truancy laws against the old order Amish to require kids to go to high school uh, to at least till age 16. The court, uh, Supreme Court of the United States upheld uh, the authority of the parents on the ground that education doesn't have to look the same for everybody. So long as the Amish giving their children eight years of uh, uh, education uh, train their children to read and write, which the Amish were happy to do. They want their children to be able to read the Bible, for example, uh, and do basic arithmetic of the sort that they would need to do in order to run their farms or run their uh, leather working businesses uh, to lead the sorts of lives that they lead as Amish people, lives that are independent. They do not become uh, uh, dependent upon the state or uh, anything like that. The Supreme Court held, that's perfectly fine. That's all we can ask of parents. That's all the state can legitimately ask. It doesn't have to educate children uh, in the way they might be educated in the schools of Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, or Silicon Valley in California, uh, or for that matter, uh, the way it's done in uh, uh, Eastern Kentucky or Southern uh, West Virginia. It can be done the way the Amish community believes it should be done for the sake of their community so long as the minimum standards are met, which the Amish were more than uh, meeting. And I think there's a lesson for us uh, in that. Uh, lay aside, there's some complicated questions of constitutional law, whether it's the legitimate role of the courts to be carving out what are called conduct exemptions from neutral laws of general applicability. Lay aside those, those constitutional technicalities for a moment. But just in terms of the political theory of the thing or the moral understanding of the thing, I think here it's very instructive. The court has said, look, Education for Amish children doesn't have to look like education for the children of Phil Lawler or Robert George uh, or the children of Elizabeth Bartholet. Uh, it can look like education for the Amish so long as the, the, the children in that community are given the kind of education will, that will enable them to lead fulfilling lives 
uh, to not become dependent on other people or on the state, to be able to conduct their personal affairs, read, write, uh, do arithmetic, uh, lead the lives that they will lead. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the actual Harvard Magazine article that precipitated this, but it had a fascinating <clears throat> sort of cartoon in it. And of course, the, the cartoonist views aren't necessarily the views of the author or of Professor Barfley, but it was, it depicted a schoolhouse or a house in which there were students looking out the window as if they were looking out the window of jail. And those were the homeschoolers. And all around them were frolicking the free children who were having a great time out in the great outdoors. And those were presumably the students at public schools. And anyone who has been involved in homeschooling, I think, would think that that cartoon was reversed. That it's the homeschoolers who generally have much more frolicking going on, working at their own pace at their own time, more outdoors and so forth. But there's a real difference of viewpoint there about what constitutes freedom. And of course, uh, Professor Bartholet's concern was that homeschool parents tend to be authoritarian. Can you comment on that vision? Uh, yes, I can. It would have been nice had the uh, cartoonist uh, commenting on the deficiencies of uh, homeschooling, it would have been nice had he uh, spelled the subjects <laughs> Uh, correctly. Right. <laughs> Turns out the cartoonist wasn't very good at spelling. So if he's going to be condescending toward homeschool uh, parents, he might show a little uh, more uh, intellectual acuity than uh, was on display in the, in the cartoon. So that's my first admittedly rather snide uh, comment. My second one uh, is more serious. Uh, I have uh, been a teacher for 35 years, just finished my 35th year uh, teaching at Princeton. Uh, as you uh, kindly noted, I've also taught as visiting professor in a number, on a number of occasions at, at Harvard, at the law school, Harvard Law School, where I myself went to law school. Um, I know a lot of Ivy League professors. Uh, they're my colleagues and friends. Most of them are wonderful people. Uh, I also know a lot of homeschoolers, in including some who've been the parents of students of mine, who've done brilliantly, by the way, at Princeton. Mm -hmm. The homeschoolers we admit, uh, I know we, we, we were able to be very selective, but boy, the homeschoolers we have uh, had here at Princeton, at least those who, who've been in my classes, have been a great credit to the homeschooling movement. It's hard to criticize the homeschooling movement when you meet kids like that who are produced by the movement. But anyway, I know through my students and in other ways, lots of homeschooling kids. Now, uh, uh, lots of homeschooling parents, lots of homeschooling people. Uh, now, bear in mind what I said a moment ago. Most of the Ivy League professors I know are wonderful people, good people, and not authoritarians. But if I was out to round up uh, and just to find authoritarians or authoritarian personalities, I think the hunting would be a little easier among Ivy League professors than among homeschoolers. Uh, mm -hmm. I, if I were Ivy League, I am an Ivy League professor. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't want to be casting any stones from my glass house at the homeschoolers. Uh, homeschoolers are exercising freedom. They're exercising a fundamental freedom, a constitutionally recognized freedom, recognized by the Supreme Court of the United States itself. Now, the Supreme Court sometimes gets things wrong, did terribly in Roe versus Wade and some other notorious decisions. So the fact that the Supreme Court ruled as it did on uh, parents' rights doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but it's worth noting that this isn't some uh, crazy new idea that homeschoolers have suddenly come up with, that there's a right to a parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children. The Supreme Court has acknowledged that for getting on now for a hundred years, actually. We're pretty close to, uh, we're approaching a hundred years of the Supreme Court recognizing that and, and, and never actually resiling from, never backing away uh, backing away from it. So they're exercising a freedom. They're, they're not in the business of denying, uh, denying freedom. I mean, honestly, I see more willingness among homeschool parents to let their children raise questions that uh, 
that uh, challenge their parents' beliefs than I do on many college campuses where very few in the professoriate or in the academic administration seem to be willing to tolerate students or faculty members expressing dissent from certain sacred doctrines uh, or doctrines that are held as sacred doctrines uh, in, the, uh, in the elite uh, sector of the academy or probably in the academy generally, uh, actually. If I'm looking for violations of free speech or freedom of thought, I wouldn't think to look in the homeschool movement so much as I'd want to look at the Yale campus or the Oberlin campus or uh, uh, one of the University of California uh, campuses. There's where I see the real concerns about free speech and authoritarianism. I mean, that's why organizations, including organizations founded by uh, people who are not conservatives, like Heterodox Academy, have sprung up. They've sprung up precisely because of these authoritarian impulses uh, that seem to have gotten out of control on many campuses in contemporary higher education. So let, let's, let's, you know, let's not focus on the homeschoolers where you know, we don't have a major problem. Let's focus on where the problem is. And a lot of it's in American higher education. I think even as a pedagogical issue, homeschoolers, the most successful ones, tend to be a little bit anarchic, I think, in, in their day-to-day, -day, I, I want to say classroom work, but of course that's wrong because it's not in a classroom usually. There's, a student might not be, a young boy or girl might not be interested in math today, he might be interested in math tomorrow, and a wise parent let, rolls with that. Uh, and it evens out over time, sort of the same way as one day he doesn't want to eat beans and the next day he doesn't want to eat meat. And over time, he gets the nutrients he needs. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot of that as well, that when with a public school, you can't do that. that math is at nine o'clock and you know, English is at 10. It's, I think, Phil, you're onto something here. And I think it's something that, um, that schools, public schools and private schools can learn from homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just uh, in a conversation uh, yesterday that involved um, um, some, some friends. It was a webinar that we did in the James Madison program at, at Princeton. Uh, Cecilia Rouse, the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School here at Princeton, who's an education economist, uh, was one of the panelists. And uh, so was the great, um, education scholar at Stanford, Bill Damon. And then the third was, a, was an education reform guy named Mike Petrilli, whom I really admire. And Mr. Petrilli was making the point that uh, some of what uh, goes on in homeschool as far as the flexibility is concerned and dealing individually with students and not having everything so regimented, just what you're pointing to, some of what is going on in homeschools can actually be transferred to schools, including to public schools. There, it's nowhere written in sacred scripture that you have to organize the school day the way it traditionally has been organized in schools, including in public schools. Mm -hmm. There's probably room for a lot of flexibility there. So uh, if I were um, someone responsible, say as a school board member uh, or school superintendent or as a principal uh, of a school, uh, again, instead of casting stones at the homeschoolers, I'd, I'd want to pay visits to some homeschool houses. I'd want to learn what I could from homeschoolers and see what we can learn from the flexibility we have in homeschooling about what could be imported into ordinary, ordinary schooling. Not, not with a view to displacing homeschooling. Let a, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let there be public schools and let there be private schools and let there be private religious schools and let there be homeschools. Let there be all sorts of things so that parents can can uh, provide the education that is most suitable in their judgment for their kids. But everybody can learn from everybody else. And I think we've got a lot to learn as far as the regular schools are concerned from homeschooling. Right, and I think that there are times when public schools can interact very positively with homeschools. We had a very positive experience in our family where our son who was homeschooled was playing on the soccer team and taking one course at the high school and yeah. doing very well and everybody was happy with it. It was a very productive experience. There's no reason that uh, homeschool and uh, regular school need to be enemies. Uh, they can cooperate. Different kids, different families have different needs. Uh, let people find the, the kind of education that works best for their kids and for their for their family, let a thousand mm -hmm. flowers bloom. I mean, 
this is a really good area, Phil, to be on the side of freedom, <laughs> you know? Now, Absolutely. Which is, they don't seem to actually want it in the areas where we should, we should have it. And, and having parents have the liberty to choose what's best for their boys and girls is really a great thing. Absolutely. Believe me, uh, Thomas More College has a disproportionate number of students who are homeschooled. And uh, so we're, we're, we're preaching to the choir to some extent here, although only a small percentage of the people who are logged on today are affiliated directly with Thomas More. But uh, it is a vision of society that is family oriented, community oriented, uh, and I think very successful. And I think most of the people who are, who are acquainted with it would, would agree with me there. Yeah. I, I, the homeschooling movement in the United States, uh, I don't know much about the homeschooling movement abroad, but I can tell you here in the United States, it's very impressive. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's moms and dads taking direct responsibility for their obligation to educate their children well. I mean, parents, most parents, want what's best for their kids. And right. so they're gonna do what's best for their kids, at least what they judge to be best for their kids. And their judgment is ordinarily gonna be better for individual kids than the judgments of people who don't know those children. I mean, this is the big advantage parents have. They don't, they, they don't uh, uh, regard children as a wholesale commodity. They don't, <laughs> children don't come at them in groups. Uh, even if they've got a gang of kids, even if you have seven, eight, nine uh, kids in the family, you know each one individually. And anybody who's been the parent of more than one kid, even if you've only had two, I mean, if you've been a parent of more than one, you are keenly aware of how different your kids are. Right. You know, how different they are and their needs okay. are different. You may have one kid for whom homeschooling is perfect, ideal. You have another kid who, who may need a different environment, uh, the kind of structured environment you have in a regular school. Mm -hmm. A family may find that for these two kids, public school works really well, but for those two kids, they're, they're, they're siblings of the first two, but still for them, they need a private class, maybe smaller classes. Maybe the pub, they, they, they wouldn't flourish in a public school with 40 kids in a class, but they'll do fine in a private school with 15. And if the parents can afford it, we should do our best to make sure that parents can afford whatever type of education they think is best for their children, but if the parents can afford it, then it makes so much sense to let the parents decide to put the kids in a private school. And if homeschooling is best for this kid, even if it's not best for that kid, then let the parents make that decision. The school superintendent doesn't know the kids individually. The governor doesn't know, the president of the United States doesn't know the kids individually. They, they may sincerely want the best for all kids. They may want the best education for all kids, but they don't know the kid. Mom and dad know the kid. Grandma and grandpa know the kid. The, the priest or minister or rabbi knows the kid. And knowing the kid is crucial if you're gonna make the best decision for the kid. We're back to where you started with the responsibility of the parent. And uh, as you mentioned, we're speaking at a time of crisis, of a health crisis. And my suspicion is that the new normal after the health crisis, whatever that may be, new normal may be, is likely to require all of us to do more to take our own responsibilities to take care of ourselves. Yes. And, um, and homeschooling is a way in which a small but rapidly growing number of Americans are taking their responsibility, thinking that, as you say, they know what is best for their child in a way that no one else is ever likely to. I think that's right, Phil. Uh, this is an important moment for the homeschooling movement. And I, and I know those who are involved in the homeschooling moment, uh, movement realize that this is an important moment. Uh, a lot of parents are having their first experience with homeschooling. Not, it's not that it's one they chose, uh, but they find themselves homeschooling or effectively homeschooling. Uh, some I think will conclude, gosh, can't wait to be done with this and get those kids back into school. Others are gonna say, you know, I didn't think I could do this. I can do it. And this is working for Sally, or this is working for Billy. Um, a lot of parents, even if they uh, are going to end up um, sending their kids back to uh, a school, a public school or a private school, will probably realize 
for the first time what it's like to homeschool. I think in many cases it will uh, result in increased respect for homeschoolers and, and, and at least a better understanding of what homeschooling actually means, what it means to educate your children at home. I think this is also gonna generate more uh, materials and I think the more materials that are generated, the, the more, let the market work here, let competition mm -hmm. drive up quality and drive down prices. Materials, curricular materials, other materials that are available for homeschoolers will increase as a result of this. So that's a little bit of a silver lining uh, lining here. I think it's a important moment for um, uh, introspection and reflection uh, by homeschoolers. And by the way, you know, Professor Bartholet and her group, the fact that they have gone very public with their uh, challenge to homeschooling and their criticism, that can be healthy too. If the homeschool movement handles this well, that can be healthy too. And I want to applaud uh, Mr. Fahey and Thomas Moore and your organization, Phil, for taking up the challenge and meeting it, not by you know, having a fit or having demonstrations or you know, condemning Harvard or any of that, but rather meeting the challenge intellectually. They have at least purported to want to do business in the proper currency of, of uh, intellectual discourse, reasons, arguments, evidence. You and those associated with you have responded by saying, fine, let's examine homeschooling using that currency, reasons, arguments, evidence, and let's just see where the chips fall. Now, exactly. I think it's easy for you to do because you know that's a battle you're going to win <laughs> because you, you know about how successful homeschooling parents on the whole have been. I do. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that someone is homeschooling successfully doesn't necessarily mean that that person will be capable of answering the arguments of law professors, which is one reason why I'm grateful to you for spending the time with us today to give people the sort of philosophical background they need to hold their own in conversations with their neighbors, with local authorities and so forth. So I, I am grateful to you for being with us. I, we have a few minutes if I can give you a question or two from our viewing audience. Certainly, certainly. And uh, to those of you out there who would like to submit questions to Professor George or to our later panelists, please email them to center at thomasmorecollege.edu. Edu. That's center at thomasmorecollege.edu. And the first question I received is a bit of a follow-up on something that I asked you. Who should get to decide the limits of state interference? You mentioned states having a reasonable interest in medical and safety concerns, but parents are seeing a lot of overreach in these areas as well. You see parents arrested for allowing children to walk in the park unaccompanied by an adult. The state can easily usurp the responsibilities of parents to make these kinds of normal everyday decisions for their children. Well, at the end of the day, uh, we live in a democracy, a democratic republic. Um, uh, we rule ourselves, we the people rule ourselves. And among the decisions we have to make as a people, we the people, among those decisions is a decision about the scope and limits of the power of government at all levels. The scope and limits of the power of local government, the scope and limits of the power of state government, the scope and limits of the power of federal government. Another decision that's gotta be made democratically is the decision about what agencies or branches of government are going to, in the end, determine how much intervention in the affairs of families will be permitted. Will it be governors and mayors? Uh, is legislation required? What's the proper role of courts, perhaps exercising the power of, of judicial review? So what I'm saying to you, Phil, and what I'm saying to the questioner is, these decisions will be made politically. They will. There's no way around that. The question of what the limits will be is not going to be made by me in my classroom uh, or by anybody else in a private capacity. They're going to be made democratically, which means we've got to be involved in, in a big way in the political process. If we want to prevail on the question of what is and what isn't a legitimate intervention by the state, by the government, in a familial matters. If, 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 we, if we have a view about what that should be, 
then we had better get into the public debate and advocate it. We better be involved in politics. We ought to be supporting candidates. We ought to be uh, where referendum initiative are uh, available. We should be involved in, in those processes. Um, there, there is just no other way. I mean, these are political decisions. At the end of the day, they're political decisions. And in a democracy, they're made by we the people. If we don't get involved, if we try, if we sit on our hands, if we abstain from political involvement, if we disdain political involvement, then we're going to get a result we don't like at all. And it's going to be more, not less government. I'll assure you of that. And it will also be inexcusable because the homeschool movement is actually fairly well organized. Uh, th these are people who know who they are. They have friends involved. They tend to group together to pool resources. This is this is uh, a tailor-made political movement, yeah. uh, and should be able to organize to uh, to overcome opposition. Uh, one of the things about a democracy, Phil, is um, it's our responsibility to persuade our fellow citizens. So we can't be satisfied just to preach to our own choir. The homeschooling movement can't just preach to other homeschoolers. It's got to go out there and persuade people who are not homeschoolers, who themselves choose a different path, who may even be skeptical of homeschooling, mm -hmm. probably largely because of ignorance about homeschooling or uh, because of scare tactics that have been used to, to uh, uh, really unjustly brand homeschoolers as covering up for abuse and so forth. Well, again, in a democracy, it's our job to persuade our fellow citizens. So we've got to go out there and do that. It's not enough just to complain. It's not enough to curse the darkness. You've got to write, light a candle. And that means reaching out, finding ways to reach out to people who are not homeschoolers, who may not be initially sympathetic to homeschooling, and explain to them what the facts are. Mm -hmm. One more question, I think. I have heard that the homeschooling movement began among secular families in the 1960s who had adhered to a question authority type mindset. Do you think Professor Bartholet and her comrades are framing the current homeschool movement in that now outdated framework? Gee, you know, I don't know. As I understand it, the conference in the end didn't come off. The Harvard conference did not come off. I don't know if it's postponed and it's gonna happen another time. So we're, we're not sure, uh, you know, what uh, will be said. Um, and, and I really don't know the answer to that question. One worry I have, and uh, Phil, you kindly mentioned that I uh, served as chairman, as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. One worry I have is that at least in some circles, what's driving um, opposition to homeschooling is anti-religious bigotry, especially mm -hmm. directed at uh, evangelical Christians and uh, uh, traditional or faithful uh, Catholics. Um, that's really bad. I mean, it's one thing to have a philosophical dispute. I understand that. Uh, people, reasonable people can disagree about things, philosophical disputes or philosophical disputes. But sometimes what is depicted as a philosophical dispute is actually not a philosophical dispute. It's prejudice masquerading as a philosophical dispute. And there are some people, uh, I, can, I can report from <laughs> where the universe, I, the part of the little part of the universe I inhabit, there are some people who really don't like evangelical Christians and really don't like traditional Catholics. And they don't like these people being able to educate their children, bring their children up in the Christian faith. Uh, and so they see homeschooling as um, a big target because homeschooling is one of the ways that parents hand on the faith to their uh, to their children. Now, I think it's really important that, that alliances be formed among uh, people who they, they may have religious differences, nevertheless share a commitment to parental values. Well, we have the development of the classical Christian schools, which I think are fantastic. Homeschoolers need to be allied with them. The Jewish day school movement is fabulous. I have some wonderful students who've come out of Jewish uh, day schools. That's a relatively new uh, phenomenon, at least at the scale that we have it now. The homeschooling movement and the Christian classical school movement need to be allied with, with uh, Jewish day schools. There are Muslim uh, families in our country now, many, uh, who, for whom uh, a schooling that includes respect for their faith is important. I think not enough Christians are willing to ally uh, with our Muslim fellow citizens, uh, as with our Orthodox Jewish fellow citizens, to make sure that all parents 
have the right to direct the upbringing and education of their children and decide for themselves whether it's going to be homeschooling, private schooling, religious schooling, uh, public schooling. Uh, it's, it's important now, I'll, I'll speak as myself, a Christian, as a Catholic. Uh, it's really important that we not claim for ourselves rights that we don't, don't recognize for other people. The right we're claiming here is not a right for Christians as such. It's a right for all people of all faiths. And we need to be in the forefront of defending the rights of people, whether they happen to be of our particular religious tradition or not. And number one, because it's right. Number one, because it's the right thing to do. And number two, because we're all in this together. And uh, we really will uh, all hang together or hang separately. Thank you very much. I don't think that that leaves us with time for any more questions. I'm grateful to you, Professor Robert George, for giving us your time uh, and for your uh, helping us to orient and encourage homeschoolers. And I look forward to seeing you again and hearing you play the, the banjo. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Phil. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to chat with you and to be part of, uh, of, of this event. And uh, best wishes for, uh, for Thomas More College. I think colleges like Thomas More do a great service to the country and I, I wish it only to prosper. Thank you very much. Thanks again. As I prepare to interview or uh, to introduce our next speaker, Again, let me remind you if you're out there watching and you have a question that you'd like to have any one of our speakers address, please send your question by email to the email address center at Thomas More, I'm sorry, center at Thomas More College dot edu. Center at Thomas More College dot edu. When I saw the Harvard Magazine article about the proposed summit meeting at Harvard Law School, and I saw one of the professors, or Professor Dwyer, who was quoted as suggesting that the state has a responsibility, that the children are the responsibility of the state, my mind immediately went to a very provocative article by Professor Douglas Farrow about how Supreme Court decisions and particularly the Obergefell decision had created a situation in which the, the state seems to be claiming first authority over student over children. In fact, the state seems to be claiming that the children are your children only because the state says so. And I was delighted then when I reached out to Professor Farrow that he was immediately willing to join us and explain that argument as he will do in just a minute. Douglas Farrow is a professor of theology and Christian thought at McGill University in Montreal where he works in theology, ethics, church, state, and social political issues. He is a author of a number of books most recently, the provocatively entitled Nation of Bastards, Essays on the End of Marriage. Professor Douglas Farrow. Thank you, Phil. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, the, <clears throat> the book you just mentioned is actually from 2007. Uh, I, I will make reference to it in passing, along with some other uh, things that may be useful to, um, to the audience here. I want to begin with the question you uh, pose, um, who owns our, your children? That may seem a very odd question. If they are your children, well, surely you do. It may also seem a rather overwrought question. People don't ordinarily raise an eyebrow at the phrase, my children or your children. This kind of thinking is part and parcel of ordinary life, but not so fast. It was part and parcel of ordinary life until a few years ago to suppose that your children were not only yours, but that they were boys or girls, that they had a sex, and that having a sex was a good thing that you or the doctor who delivered your child may have imposed a sex 
on your child wasn't commonly said, nor that your child might do well to choose, if not a new sex, then a new gender. We live as Aomer said to Aragorn in, in The Lord of the Rings, in a world all grown strange. This new and strange world is offered to us as if it were the golden wood, Lothlorien. And now we are being accused of beating a hasty retreat from that golden wood into the redoubts of a, a backward and oppressive land, the land, I suppose, of rednecks and, and traditionalists generally. Go on then, we're told, you know, beat your retreat but don't suppose you'll be taking your children with you, for they are not your children. They are everyone's children. They are, if it comes to it, the state's children, and the state will protect them from you and lead them forth into the wonders of its Lothlorien. It will not abandon them to your abuse or leave them as hapless objects in which you may replicate your own well, frankly, dehumanizing ideas and ideologies. You may feed their bodies if you like, but the state will see that their souls are fed. The state has schools for that, and all children must attend those schools. The organizers of the uh, conference that was intended for June uh, Elizabeth uh, Bartolet and uh, James Dwyers are among those who say such things. For nearly two decades now, uh, they have been trying to make the case, to use uh, Professor Dwyer's words, that parental rights must be challenged in their entirety. Parental and family rights must give way to individual rights and the rights of the state. Why? Because they conflict with, he says, principles deeply embedded in our law and morality regarding personal autonomy and self-determination, end quote. Well, actually let's quote him a little bit further. The incongruity, he says, between parents' rights and established principles regarding the nature and inherent limitations of individual rights compels us to seek other moral or and or legal principles to support and, and legitimize this anomalous set of rights, these parental rights. Parental rights, uh, he, he is arguing, um, must be reduced to parental privileges conferred by the state and maintained or withdrawn at the state's pleasure. Maintained for those who cooperate in the kind of formation the state deems appropriate, withdrawn from those who abuse children by giving them some contrary formation or rather indoctrination. For parental rights represent the domination, he says, of the strong over the weak, and the state's business is to prevent that. Now let's set aside here the question as to who is abusing whom, who is indoctrinating whom, who is the ideologue, and who is dominating whom. Mr. Dwyer thinks that parental rights, I use his words again, ultimately rest on nothing more than the ability of a politically more powerful class of persons to enshrine in the law their domination of a politically less powerful class, end quote. Last I checked, I think I agree with Professor George here, that description seemed to fit rather better law professors from Harvard or even William and Mary to say nothing of Princeton or McGill than it fit ordinary parents. It is the former in alliance with large corporations, including those from which they come, the modern universities, 
who are adept at weaponizing the law, not the latter. Let us inquire then into uh, the ideas themselves rather than, than to stay at this sort of polemical level that uh, I find as I read these, uh, these articles of theirs and into the moral and legal principles with which they work. And here, since we have only 20 minutes or so, let's focus on just three key elements in the debate, individual autonomy, the institution of marriage, and the role of religion. And let's look at these uh, briefly in their relation to one another. In chapter seven of my uh, recent book, Theological Negotiations, I have traced out the evolution of the idea of autonomy over the last millennium, approaching it as a theologian rather than a legal scholar, which I am not. I was not trying to replace uh, Schneven's book on the subject or other such works, uh, whether philosophical or legal. One can hardly do that in 40 odd pages, but to show how our recent notion of autonomy has abandoned the enlightenment without abandoning the enlightenment's philosophical roots in nominalism. And I was trying to show further that nominalism contained the seeds of its own destruction, precisely because it refused to wrestle with the individual as anything other than an individual. It would not do this respecting the divine persons, which in a millennium ago was a major part of the conversation, nor would it do so as regards human persons. It therefore could not uh, conceive of autonomy in the last analysis as anything more than raw, undisciplined exercises of the will, acting independently even of reason, and asserting itself even against the most obvious givens of human existence, such as the body. It has taken a full millennium for it to come to this, but it has. Autonomy now means, in a borrowing of biblical language, indeed in a profaning, one might well say, of the divine name, as given in the Jewish and script, Christian scriptures, I am who I am. And the first commandment in the new reality is that you must recognize me as whoever, whatever I say I am. Now, th this kind of radical individualism, this notion of autonomy that trumps reason and the evidence of the body is being used today to reshape the sphere of the body, that is the public sphere and the laws that govern it. The central locus of this reshaping is family law, which should surprise no one. For the family is the most stubborn obstacle standing in the way of this sola autonomia by autonomy alone revolution. The putatively autonomous individual, I speak of embodied individuals, of humans, not of angels, arise after all, from the sexual union of a man and a woman. And the institutionalizing of the relation between a man and a woman in the form of marriage, understood as a context for bearing and raising children, is ground zero for the passing of human culture from one generation to another. So if all that seemed too philosophical for some of you, don't worry, we've come to, we've come to things you understand more readily perhaps than, than what I've been saying. When you want to change a culture, you must change marriage. Marx and Engels knew that nearly a century and a half ago. The Soviets tried it briefly some 90 years ago. Keen observers at the, at the time, such as Sigrid Unset and G.K. Chesterton and, and uh, uh, Christopher Dawson, extrapolated the trajectory 
that this would take in the West with remarkable accuracy. And now we have arrived at a key point in that trajectory, a point in which the concerns of this conference are fully implicated. That point is called same-sex marriage. I'm not going to try to explain here since we haven't the time and it's not the direct topic of the conference, how same-sex marriage came to be either in my country or in yours. On that topic, I will say only this. In your country, as I had occasion one evening over dinner to point out to one of your Supreme Court justices, what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 16 defined as an individual right, namely, to quote, that men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family, end quote. That somehow became, through sloppy language and sloppy reasoning, a couple's right. That is, the right of any two people to demand a marriage license. Thus, in this curious slippage from the, from the concrete individual who already universally enjoyed the right to seek marriage, if not always the power, of course, to find it, from the slippage from that concrete individual to this essentially bodiless couple, this abstract union of two persons, as we already called it up here in Canadian law, the, the obstacle of marriage was overcome. The obstacle of the body was overcome. Autonomy would no longer have to take the body into account. Marriage would no longer have to take procreation into account. Founding a family could mean anything one wished it to. And family law could be changed in whole and in part to eliminate all further obstacles and impediments to the changes desired in some circles. Now, perhaps no one knows more about marriage law, historically speaking, than Professor Whitty at Emory Law School. His conclusion in, in the book called From Sacrament to Contract is worth repeating because it does, as you will see in a moment, bear directly on the concern about homeschooling. The elementary deconstructions and dismissals of a millennium long tradition of marriage and family law and life seem altogether too glib to, take, to be taken so seriously, writes Professor Whitty, I continue. Yet the legal revolution marches on and the massive social, psychological and spiritual costs continue to mount up. The wild oats sown in the course of the American sexual revolution have brought forth such a great tangle, uh, such a great forest of tangled structural, moral and intellectual thorns that we seem almost powerful, powerless to cut it down. We seem to be living out the grim prophecy that Friedrich Nietzsche offered a century ago, that in the course of the 20th century, the family will be slowly ground into a random collection of individuals, those were Nietzsche's words, haphazardly bound together in the common pursuit of selfish interests. And, adds Witty, in the common rejection of the structures and strictures of family, church, state, and civil society, end quote. As I added, however, uh, myself, when quoting this passage in Nation of Bastards, there's a further dimension to the problem. It was pointed out by another law professor, the late Ted DeCoste, um, in an essay in, called Courting Leviathan. DeCoste was convinced, and rightly, I think, that statism was the great threat that accompanied this radical individualism. For by means of the false distinction between religious and civil marriage, the state has taken possession of marriage in a paternalistic manner. It has thus, as, as, as Decauste says, committed itself to a redemptive politics, that is, by means and medium both, that makes jest of limited government. And I, I quote here, Professor uh, DeCoste a little further. 
Redemptive politics, he says, is a politics of conviction. The redemptive state is a state convinced that its proper purpose is to improve its subjects by imprinting on them, on their projects and character, the values that the state has made its own and declared superior. Such a state is not merely a custodian and guardian of the people's proper values, though it is clearly both. The redemptive state rather conceives of itself as the personification of those values, and with that of the lives of the governed properly lived. Which is to say, state and people are in theory one, and so they do in fact become to the extent that the state succeeds in disarming the people of values that contradict or diminish its values. But this transformation of the state into a person and persons into expressions of the state comes at the cost in equal measure of moral arrogance by the state and of the moral disablement of the people." End quote from uh, de Cost. But that, it seems to me, is just what Bartholet and Dwyer's and those of their persuasion have been calling for. It, it seems to me just what they actually mean to achieve. The family, which the Universal Declaration identified as, quote, the natural and fundamental group unit of society, entitled as such, to protection by society and the state, Article 16, is no longer to be such. It's no longer to be the fundamental unit. It's to be an extension of the state, operating at the state's behest, lacking all primordial or pre-political rights. As I never tire of saying, and some of you will have heard me say this before, we are all wards of the state now now that marriage has been detached from procreation and become merely a legal fiction. And those who position themselves as experts, whether medical experts or moral experts, will tell the state what it ought to do with families. Now, let's you suppose I'm, I'm making this up and cherry picking a few quotations from people who have uh, some shared concerns with the ones I'm articulating here. Um, let me quote from Joseph Raz, who in his famous uh, work, uh, The Morality of Freedom, prophesied this. Moral, more recent changes, he says, this is 2003, are uncertain and incomplete. Some tendencies, that is to, for example, to communal families or open marriages may wither away. Others, for example, homosexual families may be here to stay. It's too early to have a clear view of the consequences of these developments. But one thing can be said with certainty. They will not be confined to adding new options to the familiar heterosexual monogamous family. They will change the character of that family. If these changes take root in our culture, uh, then the familiar marriage relations will disappear. They'll not disappear suddenly, rather they will be transformed into a somewhat different social form, which responds to the fact that it is one of several forms of bonding and that bonding itself is much more easily and commonly dissoluble. All these factors are already working their way into the constitutive conventions which determine what is appropriate and expected within a conventional marriage and transforming its significance, end quote. So now at last to the point that really matters to you. Marriage, since, I'm sorry that it took so long to get around to this, but uh, I needed to clarify the background. Uh, marriage, since it's no longer procreative, since it's no longer based on intergenerational interests and functions, but only on raw autonomy and or on shared projects that any two or perhaps soon more people put together, because it's no longer procreative and intergenerational, it's no longer educative either. There's no longer any bulwark, either morally or constitutionally, that guarantees 
parental educational rights. Recall that statement of Dwyer's. It's not just educational rights, it's parental rights in their entirety, he says, which must be um, revisited rethought and in, in, and in many serious respects, removed. Their only residual instincts, residual habits of law and policy, the erosion of which in the long march through the institutions, in the universities, I must say that uh, March has not gone much further to go. It, 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 is that is the, now the goal. It, it, you, what you have to do is remove those residual patterns of life and their expressions at law uh, so as to clear the way for whatever is coming next. And hence such conferences as the, as the conference that was planned for June. So in other words, our situation I think is very, very serious. We have to see these these um, proposals in their larger context. Uh, one does not have to examine the last millennium of, of developments in the understanding of autonomy in order to get the, the main drift of this, however. The family is no longer viewed as the primary um, context for the nurturing and educating of children. Well, if you ask me, all right, that's pretty negative. Um, we have only had, uh, in the States, you've only had uh, same-sex marriage very, very recently. Uh, the other shoe or shoes has not fully begun to drop, um, uh, but it sounds very dire. Uh, what's, what's the hope? What's the sign of, of hope that you can offer? Well, I, I'll say this. I don't think the right hope is to downplay the religious connections, uh, to say, well, look, you know, religion has been privatized. L let's see if we can do this without any uh, uh, recognition of the, of the uh, theological and, and religious dimensions to this. The flourishing of the human person depends on givens givens like the body itself, givens like the gift of life. If we try to do our thinking collectively without any reference to givens and to givers, and without any reference to the great giver who is God, our creator, our whole sense of life as being a gift and of these givens that make for the public sphere, the givens that we all recognize, bodies and relations between bodies, physical spaces, which we're losing with all this Zoom business. Um, we, if, if we set all that aside, what, what makes us think that we will have any kind of foundation on which to work out these problems concerned with human flourishing? So I, 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 my advice would be, don't be afraid of the theology. Don't be afraid of the philosophy. Don't be afraid of the religious dimensions. Don't be afraid of, of identifying parents as givers of life to their children. Who owns the children? Ultimately, the creator owns the children. But who co-creates with the creator? Parents do. And they should not be bashful. And they should not be shy. And they should not be afraid to engage in the public conversation, drawing in the resources that have been handed down to them through the generations. Ms. Farrow, thank you very much. I hope you can now hear me. Yes. Good. Um, we're having no more than the predictable number of snafus with the technology. Um, I'd just like to say, by the way, in, in the interest of honesty and advertising, that when we chose the title for this conference, Who Owns Your Children? We were being deliberately provocative. We were not suggesting that parents are the owners of the children. Uh, St. Paul would suggest otherwise. I'd like to just take a moment and ask you a question. If the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes parents, the family, 
as the primary building block of society. Think of it as sort of the atom from which societies are built. Then we're now engaged in atom smashing with predictably dangerous results. From the other perspective, you mentioned what you call the redemptive state. It seems to me that if you are familiar with the political history of the United States, it's a country founded on the assumption that the people are the government. That's profoundly at odds with the notion that the government exists to perfect the people. It's absolutely stand, standing it on its head. And therefore, wouldn't it behoove us to go back to the language of the founders and recapture the understanding of limited government? Well, it, it, it certainly would, and I, I am certainly in favor of that. Um, education, of course, shapes people. It, it is formation. And, um, and so that's why this, this um, if, if family law is the center of the uh, vortex of change in our society, education law is, is very near that center because if you can achieve uh, a shift of, of uh, onus from the families and a shift of corresponding rights and responsibilities from the family to the state, then the state can form the citizens in a manner that suits the state. And then it could say, well, yes, we the people, the people in the state are at one. Um, uh, the majority culture thinks thus and so. I've found in reading this literature, of course, that that game is played uh, the way the, the uh, Bolsheviks played it. Uh, you know, we, we pretend to be the majority when we're actually the minority. Um, and then we persuade people that they must join us. And so we fulfill our own prophecy of becoming uh, the, the, the big party, not the little party. And state education, state schools can can function to further and, and hasten that process. And, and people who are working at the intersections of family law and education uh, law uh, understand that and are using it to good advantage. Um, and I think, I think at the moment, there's still a sense of, yes, we the people have a right to resist this. Uh, but if you win the next generation so that they don't want to resist it, you won, you see. And that's why, that's why both private schools, as Professor George was saying, and home schools, as he was saying, are very important in, in, um, in providing a different kind of formation. Personally, I, I, I think um, at the tertiary level, we, are, we, we need more institutions like your own because, because the long march through the, the institutions at the tertiary level is almost complete, as, I, as I've said. Yes. And this would underline your advice that those who are interested in homeschooling and maintaining parental rights should not be afraid to engage in the philosophical, theological, and political battle. Yes, and I, and I, I think we can draw on a, a better knowledge of history than I'm afraid many of our contemporaries have to say that these, these big issues were always argued in all these dimensions. And this idea that we must argue them with, with one hand tied behind our backs, uh, I, I think we, we must definitely resist. Thank you very much, Douglas Farrow, for your contribution. Uh, our next event in this summit conference is a panel discussion. We have deliberately scheduled this panel uh, the entire afternoon to move from the theoretical to the more practical. And we have now a panel discussion on the lessons to be learned and the challenges that face us in homeschooling. And my colleague, Dr. William Fahey, will be rejoining us to chair that panel. I, in fact, have rejoined you, Bill. Um, this has just been wonderful. I, I hope everyone watching right now and later this evening is um, benefiting from these marvelous 
talks. Uh, thank you again, Professor George and Dr. Farrow. This, this has just been a great beginning. Now we have a little bit of a shift to the panel. We will have three individual speakers, but hopefully at, at the end of the third talk, there will be time for questions, um, perhaps speaker to speaker, certainly from the viewers. And if I can find the sheet, you can send your questions. I think it was to uh, the center at thomasmorecollege.edu. Our first speaker on this afternoon's panel, panel entitled Successes and Challenges in Home Education is Commissioner Frank Edelblut. Um, Mr. Edelblut was educated largely in New England. He had a career in the private financial sector as a CFO and an auditor. He then um, had served as a representative in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. And in 2016, our governor, Governor Chris Sununu, um, asked Mr. Edelblut to become the commissioner of education here in the state. So we're very pleased to have him here speaking at our conference. Our viewers should know that um, Mr. Edelblut and his wife have seven children and they have also homeschooled like most of our, our viewers. So he speaks not only wearing his commissioner's cap, but with the field experience of a home educator. Commissioner. Good to see How are you. you? Thank you for that introduction. I may have a few scars to prove that point that you made as well. Um, glad to join you all this afternoon. Um, you will notice the scenic background that I have set up on my uh, Zoom account. Uh, this is Lake Jericho in the White Mountains and uh, hope that you all can find some way to uh, get out and enjoy the beauty of New Hampshire. Um, perhaps this weekend, I think the weather is gonna be warm and nice. Uh, this happens to be a fall scene, but there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, I do want to uh, actually just make one point uh, relative to uh, Dr. Fahey's introduction, because um, he introduced uh, the topic of homeschooling. And I actually prefer the term home education, uh, not homeschool, um, because in home education, the goal is a little bit different. Uh, we are not trying to recreate uh, in the home environment school, but actually try and find an alternative home base for educating children. Um, and what is really uh, interesting is that, well, I think that this, uh, this distinction is very important, first of all, um, but I would also say that the laws of New Hampshire reflect this as well. We don't have a homeschooling law, we have a home education law. Um, and we refer to this as an alternative education option for our students. Um, I will briefly just touch on the laws. I know we want to talk about kind of the framework and, and I'm happy to talk about any topics if there are questions relative to home education, um, you know, including my own experiences, but I want to reflect it about the, um, my, in my role as commissioner. Um, New Hampshire has very effective home education laws. Um, it is a relatively straightforward process for parents uh, to engage this process. They um, need to begin by filing an intent to home educate uh, their children. Um, that can be filed with a local school district. It can be filed with a um, private school uh, who would act as the custodian for them, or it can actually be filed directly with the commissioner of education for the state of New Hampshire. So it's not infrequent that when a family decides that they wanna home educate in New Hampshire, that they send a letter to me indicating their intent. Um, the information on that intent to home educate is relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, the date when you intend to begin home educating, the name and address of the student who is being home educated and the date of birth and the name of the parents and a phone number where we can reach you if something urgent comes up. Um, I often remind people that uh, the intent, filing the intent to home educate is the easy part. Um, and then you actually have to engage in the process of home educating your child, which is a, uh, a much more daunting task um, and requires a lot of work. And it is the hard part, um, but anyone who has been involved in home education knows that it is irreplaceably rewarding as well. Um, and that's easy for me to say because 
I'm at the back end of my uh, seven children and have only one child left in the home education system um, at this point in time, a, uh, a sophomore in high school. I think she's a sophomore. I should know the answer to that. Um, and so while our home, our home education law is good, um, it does, it provides a lot of flexibility for families um, with regard to sequencing and timing of the content of instruction, but it doesn't include, it does include um, some broad content categories that need to be included. Um, and these are the kinds of things that I think most people would find um, they're interested in, you know, educating their students and their children about, you know, it's sciences, math, language arts, government, history, um, important subjects and important um, formative uh, pieces of information that will help their students and, and anybody's students well into the future. Um, we do have an accountability system relative to home education here in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and understand that that accountability is built around the concept of uh, the broader education laws, which include compulsory education laws um, that require that students between the ages of six and 18 attend school. And so a home education program is a, um, an, a qualified education program that meets the requirements of compulsory education. Um, but that in accountability includes um, some various options uh, for folks to use that meet the needs of their children and their families best. Could be a portfolio review, um, which can take place by an educator or a, um, an educator who is well certified in the public system or even an educator who's not certified but is working in another qualified private education institution. Uh, they, a student could take an assessment um, or a student really can do at what's referred to as any other agreed measure. So if someone has an accountability measure that they think would make, make sense for their family, um, they again can reach out to the commissioner's office um, and we can agree on some type of an accountability measure that is really designed around the concept of your child making progress in their education, which is I think a shared um, value both for, I know this commissioner of education as well as for the parents who are involved in that home education program. Um, irrespective of the, um, you know, those accountability measures that are in place, those are not, um, you know, a basis for discontinuing a home education program. Um, and it's interesting that how, uh, you know, this, these laws have, we, we had some other laws in the past and those laws have changed. And so that's kind of the basic schema that we have here in New Hampshire. Um, and I think that it serves our families. I think it serves our students um, and it serves our communities very well. Um, it was interesting uh, when in this role, if there are issues that come up around home education, and quite frankly, we don't have a lot of them, um, but they generally tend to center around that intent to home educate. And it may be that the agency that is receiving that intent to home educate. So um, if a, a family is filing an intent to home educate with a local school district, it may be that the local school district is unfamiliar with the laws and what those requirements are. Um, and so they may ask the family to provide information that is beyond the scope of our law. So for example, they may say, well, it's all good and well that you're gonna be home educating your students, but we need to know what are the curricular materials that you will be using and how will you be doing the instruction and how many hours a day will you be working on uh, that instruction? When in fact, those are not requirements under the New Hampshire law. And so, um, you know, with a quick conversation, we can uh, familiarize everyone, uh, you know, with what the requirements and the law say, um, and we can begin to move forward and because that information would not be required. Um, I know that today's conversation is really centered in response uh, to um, Ms. Bartholet's article in, in the Harvard Review and some of the assertions that she made. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, just I wanted to reflect briefly on that. And then I know we've got other panelists coming in and they're going to, and then we can do some questions. Um, but, you know, it is widely known that home educated students are a wonderful advertisement for more home education. Um, having, uh, you know, raised some and met many, many hundreds, probably thousands over the years, um, I think they are a, um, a testament to the effectiveness of home education. Uh, it doesn't mean that there are not some, uh, you know, areas of improvement that can happen and that it's not all perfect all the time, but I think generally speaking, that's a good generalization. 
Um, I want to just focus on a couple of the, the criticisms that were brought up in uh, Ms. Bartholet's article. Um, one is the question of how do we know they're learning? Um, you know, and in, and in particular, um, you know, how do we know they're making the kind of progress that we would expect from them? And I think that this is a question that we should not ask and limit ourselves to only the home education environment, but should consider that question broadly across all education systems. Um, how do we know that our students in our public education system are learning? How do we know that our students in a, maybe a private setting or a home education setting are learning? Um, and because we know that particularly with home education students that they regularly outperform their peers across a whole number of measures. Um, so if in fact we wanna point that question of how do we know they're learning? Uh, we ought to, you know, if a, as a public education system should first be reflective um, relative to the students that are in their care as well. Um, I think as well, people might, um, you know, there's a concern that people who are home educating may not be that educated themselves. And again, this is the criticism of Ms. Bartholet. Um, and I think it really just uh, reemphasizes her lack of understanding of home education. Uh, we know that across the board, again, that students who are in home education environments outperform their peers across a whole number of measures. But in fact, this point uh, struck a chord with me um, because in uh, you know, our traditional education system, um, family income, as an example, is a strong predictor of academic achievement. We know regularly when we provide assessments for, to students in the school system that students who are economically disadvantaged perform you know, as much as 20 percentage points lower than other students on those same types of assessments, resulting in a great deal of inequity in that system. Um, and in home education, you don't have that disparity. Those equity um, opportunities are closed. And what we find is that family income is not a predictor of academic achievement. And I think that uh, Ms. Bartholet might actually be um, impressed if she were to look at that. Um, and so then I guess the last thing that I just wanna uh, lean in on a, a little bit before turning this over to the other presenters here is, um, I'm not sure that Ms. Bartholet, when I was reading it, realizes um, the lack of tolerance that she exhibits when she herself uh, states that she's concerned that home educated students will lack tolerance of other people's viewpoints. Um, and I, it, it just seemed an irony to me that she would be saying that uh, towards folks whose views uh, she may not herself be tolerant of, um, particularly the viewpoints of families who come and choose uh, to home educate their own children. So I am happy to join um, with you all this afternoon. I'm happy to join with my co-panelists and look forward to uh, participating and responding to questions that you all may have. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Commissioner Edelblut. Um, up next on our panel, we have Carrie McDonald. Mrs. McDonald is the Senior Education Fellow at the Foundation for, or Foundation for Economic Education. She's also an adjunct fellow at the Cato Institute and the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside of the Conventional Classroom. And uh, very grateful for her spending some time with us this afternoon. Anyone who's interested can go to the FEE website. Um, again, that's the Foundation for Economic Education. And if you go to Carrie McDonald's page, towards the bottom of that page, you can sign up for a weekly newsletter where you can receive her articles that she um, pens or types, as the case may be. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, you know, this is such a timely topic, of course, in so many ways, not only the Harvard Magazine article, but also the fact that we are really at this transformative moment in American education as over 50 million US students are not in school 
due to COVID-19 and they're engaging in various degrees of school at home, distance learning. Uh, and in some ways, even though we have such limited freedom right now uh, as families and are all confined in our homes, it's interesting because many parents are becoming re-empowered, really reconnecting with their children and getting a better glimpse of their child's education uh, and potentially even experiencing maximum educational freedom. Some states, for instance, have shelved compulsory attendance mandates, curriculum directives. Uh, some districts are starting to end their school year early, uh, sort of ending their foray into distance learning for now with hopes that things improve te technologically for fall. Or they're explaining that any schoolwork being offered this spring is optional and for enrichment purposes only, particularly if they can't guarantee uh, full, uh, full equitable access to all students because of, again, connectivity issues or technology issues. Uh, and it's a real opportunity for families to disconnect from school and to really re-engage with their children and, and think about education as separate and distinct from schooling that I think Commissioner Edelblus so rightly pointed out that you know educate schooling is one method of being educated but it's certainly not the only one and I would argue perhaps not the preferred one the realities of the innovation era when human uh, creativity is really the thing we have to be focused on that is the our key advantage as we increasingly coexist uh, in a world of artificial intelligence it's interesting if we look at some of the data, even though, of course, again, 50 million US students home now with their families, um, isolated from their communities, uh, Ed Choice recently put out a survey where they asked families about various uh, experiences during the pandemic. And they found that more than half of their survey respondents actually have a more favorable view of homeschooling uh, as a result of the pandemic than they did before. Uh, and so I would say, you know, gee, if you're satisfied with homeschooling now, uh, confined in our homes and isolated from our communities, just wait till you see the real thing when you can truly be uh, immersed in the people, places and things around you. But I think that that's a good sign that more families would be interested in homeschooling uh, or alternatives to school and other education options post pandemic. Another more informal survey conducted by Corey DeAngelis, who's the director of school choice at the Reason Foundation, recently found that 15% uh, of his survey respondents, he had over a thousand respondents, indicated that they would be choosing homeschooling uh, come fall. And again, uh, even if that isn't, even if it's not the full 15%, it shows that there will be an uptick, I think, in homeschooling, uh, even if it's just temporary, if even if it's just temporary, the Wall Street Journal, for example, reported that Denmark uh, was the first country, European country, to reopen schools amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, and thousands of parents in Denmark chose to keep their children at home. Uh, so even if it's just temporary homeschooling, I think it's an opportunity for parents. Uh, to again be put back in the driver's seat of their of their children's education. We see similar historical evidence that parents are unlikely to send or all parents are unlikely to send their children back to school. Um, coming out of the 1916 polio epidemic in New York City, where about a quarter of the students stayed home in New York City when schools were reopened, which actually led to a temporary loosening of compulsory attendance laws. And so I think we'll see a lot of this happening uh, this fall or, or uh, whenever schools open here. Um, but it is an opportunity and a real springboard, I think, for families to consider homeschooling, particularly as remote working gains popularity. Uh, the Brookings Institution, for example, put out a recent report predicting a permanent shift toward teleworking for many employees, uh, even again after the pandemic ends. And I think that more families will see that they'll wanna give that same freedom and flexibility that they have in their work to their children for education. And it may also open up doors of opportunity for more flexible education options that if parents are working from home, they may not feel uh, the urgency to send their children away to uh, a standard school all week. 
Um, and then as parents really begin to explore these different education options, again, back in charge of their children's education, I think that they will be intrigued by discovering what 21st century homeschooling really looks like. Uh, and it's nothing like that caricature presented in the one-sided Harvard Magazine article recently, um, and of course, in the much more in-depth Arizona Law Review article by Professor Elizabeth Bartholet. Today's nearly 2 million homeschoolers are increasingly reflective of the overall US population demographically, geographically, socioeconomically, ideologically. Uh, we see a lot of growth in minority homeschooling population. The percentage of black homeschoolers doubled between 2007 and to 2012 to about 8% uh, of the overall homeschool population. And the population of Hispanic homeschoolers is about 25% of the overall US homeschool population, which mirrors uh, the Hispanic population and the overall K to 12 uh, school age population. Uh, urban secular homeschoolers like mine, uh, urban secular homeschooling families like mine, I live just down the road from Harvard's main campus here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, are one of the fastest growing segments of the overall homeschooling population in the US. Uh, many of these uh, urban homeschoolers are disillusioned by one size fits all schooling models, size testing, uh, and really are looking for other options, much more individualized learning and personalized learning than they could find in a conventional classroom. Uh, and so I think, again, we're seeing a lot more growth in, in terms of um, the overall diversity of the and homeschool population. In the Harvard Magazine article, and twice in Bartholet's Arizona, Arizona Law Review article, she says that up to 90% of today's homeschoolers are driven by conservative Christian beliefs. And I have sort of two responses to that. One would be to say, first, you know, so what? If that were true, why would that be an indicator of a need to heavily regulate the practice or potential? Um, regardless of the, the distribution of who's, you know, who's participating in homeschooling. But beyond that, better data suggests that about two thirds of the US homeschool population identifies as Christian, which is re reflective of the overall US population as a whole. According to the Pew Research Center, about two thirds of the US population identifies as Christian. So again, homeschooling would be reflective of the overall American population. Um, but religion is not the top motivator for today's homeschooling families. In fact, the most recent data out of the US Department of Education uh, finds that only 16% of respondents in this national, uh, national survey said that religion was the most uh, important factor in their decision to, to homeschool. In fact, the number one motivator for today's homeschooling families in the US is concern about the environment of uh, other schools including safety, drugs, and negative peer pressure. Uh, so, you know, we may have religious homeschoolers and we have certainly, again, a diverse group of homeschoolers today, but religion is not what is driving most homeschoolers. It may be driving some, but not the majority. Again, it's that concern about what's happening in other schools and really wanting different educational options. Uh, we can talk a little bit about outcomes of Today's homeschooling families uh, or to today's homeschoolers, most peer reviewed studies, for example, find that uh, homeschoolers uh, excel academically, in some cases uh, better than their school peers and have positive um, life outcomes. A study by Peter Gray, Boston College psychology professor who studies unschoolers or those who engage in more self directed education tied to homeschooling. He also wrote the forward to my unschooled book. He finds that uh, similar results that grown unschoolers grow up to uh, succeed in whatever path they choose. They do well in college if they choose to go there, uh, have no trouble academically. And in fact, I think one of the more interesting findings of his study is that more than half of the adults in his grown unschooling study uh, were working as entrepreneurs in careers tied to interests that developed in childhood and adolescence. Again, the sort of freedom to learn in childhood and adolescence that's so critical. Um, you know, one of the, I think, more egregious claims that Bartholet makes in, uh, again, both the Harvard Magazine article and the Arizona Law Review article 
uh, are that this idea that homeschool children are kept at home and isolated from the larger community. Um, but that is, is just so untrue. You know, if you think about not only the research that's come out recently, but even research dating back um, 10 or 15 years ago, most of the, the good peer reviewed research on homeschooling finds that homeschoolers are quite well connected to their communities, quite well socialized. In fact, Daniel Hamlin out of the University of Oklahoma published an article in the past year that found that homeschoolers have high levels of what he calls cultural capital, really immersed in their communities, going to the library, going to museums, going to cultural events, sporting events, mu music events, and so on, in some cases at higher rates than their school peers, because of course they have that much more flexibility in their daily schedules. Uh, you know, I'll just give a little bit of a background before I wrap up on, on how I became interested in homeschooling. This was back in the late 1990s, uh, when I was an undergraduate in college, I was an economics major, but became really interested in education in particular, look at the choices that in education and, and the choices that they couldn't make because of uh, system of family who lived nearby. And um, again, this 90s homeschooling had just become legally recognized in all 50 states a few years prior by the mid 1990s. Uh, so it was a relatively new phenomenon. And I just remember being completely enchanted by this homeschooling family and the real authentic socialization that I saw in their family, engaged in their community, uh, authentic learning tied to the child's interests. And it was really in stark contrast to that same semester when I was doing a, a student teaching practicum in a local public elementary school and saw uh, how much more confined and controlled the school children were compared to uh, the homeschool child. And that really, that image really stuck with me. It's what ultimately prompted me to go to graduate school in education policy at Harvard, where I became more interested in educational choice and freedom, as well as alternative education. But it wasn't until about a decade later when I was a mom looking at education options for my own children that I discovered you know, the real joy of homeschooling and realized that you know, if I sent my children to school, their learning would contract. They would go to the same building every day with the same age segregated group of peers, the same static handful of teachers doing the same standardized curriculum. And instead, I really wanted my children to be fully and authentically immersed in our community, taking classes through local libraries, museums, nature centers, interacting with mentors and tutors and peers. Uh, so to me, you know, sending them to school would be more isolating uh, than, than being immersed in their community. And I think that's where I was particularly um, surprised by Bartholet's portrayal of homeschoolers uh, as being isolated when, the, when the, real, the opposite is really true. So I'll, I'll just begin to close up by saying that, you know, I think as more parents warm up to homeschooling uh, during this uh, COVID homeschooling experience, uh, as they disconnect from their local school district, they may be re-empowered and decide to choose homeschooling. I think that they will also see that there's all kinds of ways to homeschool now, that hybrid homeschooling models in particular are getting increasingly popular where you're able to uh, have your child at home part of the time and then in the community or in various learning centers or schools for part of the time that opens up this option to more families, particularly to two working families or single parent families. I think it's a great time for education entrepreneurship, particularly in the homeschool space uh, that will also help to expand new options to more families. Um, you know, the pandemic has led to massive disruption in how we live and learn. Uh, and I think this will be a defining moment, not only for homeschooling as more parents choose this option, but for educational freedom more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie McDonald. And um, we look forward to having you sit with the panelists, um, if one does sit in Zoom land, uh, for a bit of conversation after our third speaker. If you've been watching and you have questions, you've been jotting down questions either for Commissioner Edelblut or Carrie McDonald, please make sure that you send those to us at the following email address Center at thomasmorecollege.edu.
Thomas More College, all one word. And that Thomas More has only one O in it, thomasmorecollege.edu. The next panelist is Andrew Beckwith of the Massachusetts Family Institute. Um, there he is. Hello, Andrew. Uh, okay. Andrew is a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Marine Corps, and he has served as a judge advocate. I think, do you still serve as a judge advocate for the Marines? In the reserves, yeah. In the, in the reserves. Um, but once a Marine, always a Marine. Number five. So uh, Andrew was educated at Gordon College and attended law school at the University of Minnesota. Um, he was a litigator, I think, for Homeland Security in, in Boston, if I remember. But for the last several years, he has been in charge of Massachusetts Family Institute, which if you're not familiar with it, whether you're in the region or not, you should become familiar with it. Certainly in New England, MFI is the foremost defender of marriage and the family. Uh, and Andrew has been dynamic as a leader of MFI. Um, it's one of the few Massachusetts organizations that I happily recommend sitting up here in the Granite State. So I'm looking forward to your, your comments, Andrew. And, and when Andrew's finished, all our panelists will come back and we will begin some conversation and questions. Andrew. Thank you for that. And it's a pleasure to, to join you virtually here. We, we're living through strange times. And uh, I can only imagine what Professor Bartlett would have thought if you had told her back in January or December or whenever she planned the summit that not only would the summit be canceled, but that virtually every child in America would be homeschooled, at least for a period of time. Um, and I echo uh, Carrie's comments that I hope that parents will take from this um, sort of a, a normalization or a renormalization of if not homeschooling or home education itself, but the idea that the parents are the fundamental educators of the child. And uh, they may delegate that right or responsibility to others, but that it flows from and through them and not from uh, the state. And as Drs. George and Farrell kind of mentioned, the idea of the family uh, or the marriage precedes even the formation of the state. Uh, so the state really lacks the the fundamental right to define it or to control it in many ways. And I, I would say the same is true of home education, that that is something that obviously has gone on for you know, centuries, if not millennia, prior to the formation of the state. So that the right to educate your child as a parent uh, and that responsibility precedes the state as well. So in my line of work, uh, we focus on, among other things, um, parental rights, because that is obviously fundamental to the, both the formation of families and the ability to pass on the, the faith to the next generation, which is very important. And so I'll, you know, I'll get phone calls from parents that uh, demonstrate to me how the state, um, you know, a bureaucracy, sometimes hostile bureaucracy is trying to wedge itself in between parents and children. Um, oftentimes this happens in the public school setting and I may touch on that in a minute, but I do wanna to touch first on the medical setting, which is sort of universally applicable even to homeschoolers. So for example, I got a call from a mom who uh, was taking her 13 year old son to the doctor's office um, just to get a physical so they could do youth sports and um, I get calls like this fairly often where parents will say, look, I had uh, my son or my daughter getting a physical, the doctor asked me to leave the room, so I left the room um, because you do what the doctor tells you to do, right? And the next thing I know, my child's telling me all these crazy sexual questions that the doctor has asked them about how many partners they've had and when do they start being sexual act, sexually active? And do they have any STDs? And are they using recreational drugs? And they might be pregnant. Um, how do they sexually identify uh, as you know, straight or queer or um, gender fluid um, or dragon kin? You know, all this bizarre stuff. And the parents are just kind of bewildered because they thought they were there for just sort of a basic physical. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the mom was trying to get access to the son, I guess 13-year-old, 13-year-old son's web health portal 
uh, in order to get the documentation, the physical to give to the coach so they could do their youth sports. And she couldn't log in. So she calls the doctor's office and they said, well, yeah, your, your son's 13. So you can't, you don't have access to his health portal now. Um, you'd have to bring your son to the medical office so that he could request his username and password. Uh, and then if he wants to share that with you, it's up to him. And, you know, mom was pretty upset with that. So she called the doctor who she was friendly with, the pediatrician, who wasn't even aware of this and said, oh, well, I was wondering why you hadn't responded to some information I'd sent you through your son's web portal. I didn't know you didn't have access to. So I started looking into this uh, and, it, and it turns out that the reason why doctors are asking these questions is because under Massachusetts law, and this is I think consistent with many states across the country, uh, children can be deemed mature minors if they have engaged in sexual activity or used uh, illegal drugs, or if they might be engaging in sexual activity or might be pregnant or might have an STD. Um, if they mention that, any of those things to a doctor while they're alone one-on-one, -on -one, then that conversation and any diagnosis and any treatment that flows from that conversation is all confidential. And it can only be released to the parents if the child allows it. And I, don't, I think most parents weren't aware of that. Um, and then furthermore, because going back to this one mom with a 13 year old son who couldn't get into the web health portal, he's not sexually active, doesn't have any of this stuff going on. He's 13, had just turned 13. So I, I talked to the doctor's office and they put me in touch with the medical records office. And lo and behold, they looked at those mature minor laws and decided that, well, it's possible that a 13 year old could have had some confidential conversations with the doctor. So just to be safe, we're gonna make automatically all children's uh, web portals and medical information that's online. Once they hit age 13, boom, it's gonna be confidential. Parents can't get access to it unless the child gives it to them. So there's this sort of legal and technocratic assumption that we're just gonna come between the child and the parent at the age of 13 arbitrarily without any justification. And that's just one example of what parents are up against when they try to exercise their responsibility. Um, and you know, very concerning stuff that I think goes on under the radar. So more overtly, if we switch back to the public schools, because this has implications for all parents, uh, in the town of Westford, Massachusetts, I was there for a school committee meeting where they were debating, really sort of announcing the implementation of a gender identity policy. Now, it's interesting that a couple of the previous speakers have touched upon how the redefinition of marriage and uh, so sort of the sexual revolution have interjected themselves, again, in between parents and children. And this is crystal clear on the idea of gender identity. So in Westford, they introduced this policy and part of it was that uh, parents would not be notified if their children identified as something other than their, their physical sex, their biological sex, um, until, until that child said it was okay. Because if the child didn't feel quote unquote safe at home, then they wouldn't notify the parents. And they used this term, uh, highly rejecting parents, to characterize moms and dads who would not be supportive of or embrace the fact that their son or daughter wanted to be a daughter or a son or something in between. So you literally could, literally could have a 13 year old kid go to school, a boy, put his backpack in the locker, take out a dress, put it on, identify as a girl all day, and the parents would never be told. Um, now the language of highly rejecting parent is also concerning from the legal perspective when you combine it with things like this, I just wanna read real briefly here, uh, an excerpt from an email sent to parents who are trying to, they're applying to be foster parents. And we all know that there are so many children who need loving foster families and adoptive families. Well, here in Massachusetts, the Department of Children and Families sent this denial letter to a, a good family because of this. They say, although many foster parents may not end up accepting a referral, for a youth who identifies as GLBTQ. This status may change over time. As in any birth family, there is a possibility that the child you are parenting may one day share with you their identity as a GLBTQ person. 
It is important that you have a base knowledge of sexual orientation so that you can avoid responses or reactions that may be potentially harmful. Regardless of personal beliefs, our pre-adoptive families must be able to provide a safe, nurturing, and non-judgmental environment for our children presently and potentially years down the road. And what this family was told was that their sincerely held religious beliefs, which were, I think, sort of the, the common beliefs held by everyone until about five minutes ago, um, that you know, boys are boys and girls are girls, and that sex is you know, belongs between in marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, that that's what they would support as far as behavior and identities for their children. They'd love and support their child no matter what, but they're not going to support behaviors. Uh, that are contrary to their faith and frankly to biology and common sense. And what they were told was that they are not fit parents, not a fit family to, to be a foster family. Um, and that even if they adopted a child that right now um, didn't identify as GLBT or Q, that they said even 10 years down the road, they could come out as one of those identities. And if you didn't support them, then that'd be a problem. So because of that, you're not gonna be allowed to adopt. So it's not just in the public schools where you see this. Uh, it's not just in even the medical profession, but the ability to adopt children, to form a family in that sense, to fulfill our biblical mandate to care for orphans in their distress. Our hands are being tied on that. There's another example on parental rights in general. It's not tied to to the sexuality issue, but I think is very important for people to be aware of. And it goes back to the medical issue and this idea of the state knowing best. Um, Justina Pelletier was a 14 year old girl in 2013. She had a unique um, medical condition. She was receiving treatment from a doctor at Tufts Hospital. Um, and her parents had to take her to Boston Children's Hospital for a specific physical ailment she had and the doctor from Tufts recommended they take her to a colleague at Boston Children's Hospital. Long story short, she never saw that colleague uh, at Boston Children's. She was seen by a psych intern who diagnosed her as not having a physical ailment, but rather having a psychological uh, issue that's brought on by her parents. And Boston Children's Hospital decided they weren't gonna treat her for a physical ailment, but would only treat her for her, her supposed mental health issue. And when the parents decided okay, no, thank you. We're just going to take her back to Tufts. We don't want that course of treatment. They had uh, police escort the parents out and they proceeded to keep Justina in state custody through the Department of Children and Families who were called by Boston Children's Hospital for over a year, for over a year, because you had two doctor's opinions. The parents chose Dr. A. The state apparently chose Dr. B and therefore the parents lost custody of the child. And it wasn't until the father went against the orders of the judge in family court that put a gag order on him uh, to the court of public opinion, his court of last resort, that finally she was sent home. Very tragic story. Um, but that's the type, that, that's the repercussions of this idea of saying that uh, your parenthood flows from the state. The state can very easily take it away when its experts have determined that it is no longer in the best interests of the child. Um, and so that is one of the things that, that we're up against. And the, you know, the conference, uh, that I guess the summit now that has been postponed or canceled at Harvard was very concerning because it seeks to normalize this idea that the rights of parents flow from the state. Um, you know, there's a refrigerator magnet, I think, at my house um, that says something to the effect of, you know, children are on loan to you from God. Uh, and the scripture, of course, says children are a gift or inheritance from the Lord. And what Bartlett and her company are saying is that they are actually on loan to you from the state. So they are literally putting the state in the place of God when it comes to the family uh, and parental relationships. And, you know, I see here in Massachusetts on Beacon Hill, when you bring in experts from Harvard Law School, the legislature listens, the courts listen. So even though what they're saying um, in their Law Review articles and elsewhere seems preposterous to me as a parent, I know that people in positions of influence will take them seriously. So it is not something that I you know, blow off. I'm glad it's been postponed. I'm glad it's being countered um, by events like this. 
but it's definitely a concern. And I'm glad that, you know, HSLDA, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which I think was one of the targets of um, Professor Bartlett's concern. I'm glad that they, they're out there and protecting families. They've worked with me. Um, we have a situation in our own school district where there was supposedly going to be a, a revised or updated homeschool policy that was, again, sent, for, sent from the state bureaucracy. There's nothing wrong with the existing policy. The updated policy was actually somewhat contrary to existing law. And I worked with HSLDA to get probably a dozen other homeschooling families to go to this school committee subcommittee meeting of about three people in the small room at the uh, school's offices one night. There's a dozen of us there, two of us were attorneys. We had all our paperwork laid out. And you know, we still look this update, this updated policy was gonna be detrimental to our families. One example would be to make it harder for our kids to participate in extracurriculars in the public school system like sports. And uh, we, we kind of just made it clear that, look, you need to fix this now, or we're gonna come back again at the next subcommittee meeting, probably with all our kids and likely our chickens, because that's how homeschoolers roll. And they backed off. Um, and I think that's what we have to do is be vigilant at the, at the local level, it can be done in small scale, but also at larger scale. Uh, as I think it was Dr. Farrell mentioned, um, uh, we, we've gotta be vigilant on this stuff and we've gotta be active in politics and policies, even though we'd rather just be you know, home, making homemade yogurt uh, and doing what homeschoolers do. And I can say that because I'm a homeschool father of four, um, we have to engage in the public realm and the policy realm in order to protect that for our kids and for their progeny, frankly. Um, but I do hope that this massive experiment in unplanned homeschooling goes well for many families, that they embrace it if it's right for them, but that they at least internalize that there's nothing weird about educating your kids at home. Um, you know, that should be the norm and, and the burden of proof should be on others to say that that right uh, isn't the norm and that something else should be done instead. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I think in in a few seconds, the the screen here will be populated by the other panelists, um, and I will be able to take some questions that have begun to come through. Um, so I'll wait till everyone appears, and then here we are, all together again, ask some questions. I I'd like to um, pick up myself with. Um, comment that Andrew just made and, and other speakers have made in different fashion. And I believe, Andrew, you said uh, parenthood, one of the problems is we have enshrined an attitude and sometimes in law that parenthood seems to be flowing from the state or is somehow an extension to the state. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question that everyone can respond to, but I, I'd like to begin with the commissioner since he and I are from the same state, and I, by and large, agree with his assessment of um, the process and, and how straightforward it is. And, and quite frankly, we lived in another state a, a little over a decade ago, and it wasn't, um, the laws weren't as friendly to homeschooling as New, New Hampshire's. New Hampshire has a good, good process. But I'll share with the commissioner my concern that relates to this wider issue of a general sense that's often more than a sense enshrined in law that the family and education is the business of the state and it's only extended to families and parents. Now in our own law in the Granite State, the, the law, at least the text that I've read it says in RSA 193A2, there is established the home education program to be administered by the Department of Education. But that's the opening remark for home education or homeschooling in the state of New Hampshire. It's, it's only two or three sections below that, that it says home education shall be provided by a parent. It seems to me that at least we're vulnerable in that language of seeing home education as something that is lent by the state to the parents. But that's very different than what Dr. Farrow and Professor George were talking about, where the family is the basic cell, the building block of society. It has the first and prior right, 
principle of subsidiarity, the state can enter if there's an abuse or a failure. But my fear is at least you could interpret the New Hampshire law, which I imagine is very similar to other state laws, as home education is merely lent to the parents. What would you say to that, Commissioner? Uh, so great question, and thank you for that. And um, I don't disagree, I think, with any of the panelists relative to the a priori um, role of parents in, uh, you know, the responsibility of the education of their students, and, and not just the education, quite frankly. You know, um, Andrew talked about, uh, you know, the health decisions, but there's just, this is a whole myriad of, um, you know, of, of areas that parents are responsible for. And what we want to avoid is what sometimes you can observe, which is the state somehow wants to take responsibility until there's a problem and then all of a sudden it becomes the parents problem. And uh, I think that is, you know, an evidence that, um, you know, in fact, they don't want the responsibility, they just want the control. Um, but what I would say is relative to you referenced uh, RSA 193A2 establishing a program. And I think it's probably appropriate to and just to be clear on this call, I'm not the lawyer, uh, but I think it's appropriate to go back to the context of this law. And so this law sits in the context of a precedent that says, you know, by the state, we have a compulsory education law that says all students between the ages of six and 18 shall be engaged in the public education system. And so this law, which, um, you know, came after that compulsory education law is really an attempt, I think, to create a carve out, not a redo of that. So it would, so by its very nature, I'm going to guess that the evolution and how this law came about was as a carve out, not as a principled statement that says, um, you know, that students have this compulsory education, uh, you know, requirement that exists. Um, and so it's really just saying, okay, there's a section that we're going to carve out of compulsory education and allow this to be a, a legitimized and established means of education. But so, so your slippery slope theory and your concern there, I think, is legitimate, but this wouldn't be the place to so much um, attack that as much as go back to the premise, which is this, this law exists in the context of a premise that the state has this compulsory education law. And that's, I think, the, the foundation that you would need to begin to erode and say, because if that premise holds, and uh, then anything beyond that is just gonna be a carve out, right? But if you go back to that initial premise and say like, what is the, the uh, underlying responsibility for education? And if we establish that as the parents have the underlying education and from that underlying education flow, options, which could be a public education system, a, public, a private education system, or a home education in system, um, then I think this, you wouldn't have language that you've just described there. Very good, thank you. Um, I've had several versions of this question, which seems um, that it might be best to direct towards uh, Carrie McDonald, at least for an initial response. Uh, several people were struck at your positive read, backed with some um, data and, uh, and other kinds of evidence, your positive read of the current situation where so many Americans are in a way homeschooling, although I think a, I think a number of homeschoolers don't really want to call <clears throat> receiving dozens of emails from, from um, the public school and replicating what the public school wants you to do as homeschooling. But at, but at least in general, there's a, an experience of education in the home that wasn't there before that is widespread. And you referenced the polio epidemic as giving us some um, guidelines and history of, of how society reacted. And you said there was a loosening up of laws. So a number of people have asked a question, do you think that there's good evidence that there will be this thawing and a moment of openness to homeschooling? Or do you think that um, it is more likely that pro prof professors of law that have stood against homeschooling will, if not panic, become very concerned and redouble their efforts at fighting homeschooling? 
Great question. I'd say first, I again agree that what we're all experiencing now is nothing like authentic homeschooling. Um, you know, I think uh, most of us who are our homeschoolers will say that we spend more of our time outside of our homes typically than inside of our homes, uh, that, that this experience is really tough on everybody and is definitely more of a, a distance learning at home, school at home uh, for those 50 million US families. But I think it is, uh, it, it's encouraging that given these constraints and this difficulty that we're all going through that we still have more than half of families in that recent Ed Choice survey saying they have a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result of the pandemic. So I think we'll, we'll, we will see some more interest. To get to the heart of your question though, I think that um, just by necessity, because there is going to be so much fluidity going forward with the pandemic, going back to school, there'll be, I think, uh, a blend of going to school and distance learning. Um, you might have instances where some children are going back to school, but if they live with elderly grandparents, they may not be going back. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of these exceptions. I think uh, NPR recently had an article about what it might look like when schools are reopened. And Commissioner Edelblum can probably share more about this in, in New Hampshire, but uh, NPR saying, you know, staggered schedules. So some kids might go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday one week, and the next week they'd go Tuesday and Thursday and keep swapping to uh, maintain social distancing and lower building capacity. And I just think a lot of families aren't going to want to put up with this, particularly as scenes uh, are coming out from around the world now of young people going back to school in full face shields and wearing masks all day and having these socially distanced classrooms and not being able to go to the cafeteria or to the gymnasium, not having parents allowed in the building. I think there's gonna be enough of that uh, uncertainty and, uh, and fear um, that families, many families will decide that they wanna choose some other options. And then I think as a result, uh, there will be this sort of loosening. There'll be just so many families that are not sending their kids back that there'll be some loosening of compulsory schooling statutes temporarily. Uh, whether or not those families register as homeschoolers, I think is another question, but I think temporarily we will just see that families won't be sending their kids back. I worry then in the next phase, uh, when we kind of revisit uh, Professor Barthollet, maybe next June when the summit is supposed to, the Harvard summit is supposed to reconvene, you know, that might be another time to really think about where we're at at that point. We'll have a better sense of numbers of homeschoolers, what the impact of the, of the pandemic has been on homeschooling and other forms of alternative education and uh, private schooling. So uh, we'll wait and see. And I think, you know, back to Andrew's point, we have to be constantly vigilant uh, and push back against these calls for heightened regulation or presumptive bans. Thank you. Um, to more or less stay on schedule, I'm going to, going to pose one more question for everyone, but we'll start with Andrew. Um, I think it was Professor George that said in a, in a democracy, it's the duty of all to persuade those who don't share or understand their own um, beliefs and values, to persuade them of the validity of their beliefs, so that at least there is a mutual understanding. What in this space of time, whether it's just a few months or a full year before there's a reaction, um, what is the positive thing? What would you say is one positive thing that those involved in home education and homeschooling could do to help persuade or educate those who don't really understand home education? Andrew, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, I mean, just on a real practical level, one of the things that my wife did early on was package up some math textbooks that we then, you know, wiped down with a Clorox wipe. And I drove them over with the face mask to some friends of ours who are having to do home education. Uh, and the public schools just hadn't sent out any plan yet. So they were just adrift for almost a week. Um, so, you know, sharing our experiences and our resources and not being embarrassed by it. I remember initially being asked, so you guys are homeschooling aren't you concerned about your child's socialization? And eventually it occurred to me to respond truthfully, yes, which is why I'm homeschooling. And we saw that reflected, I think I saw an article last week by a, a public high schooler who's at home and was saying that, you know, it's, it's tough, but I'm not worrying about bullying anymore. I can do my schoolwork without all the discipline problems in the class. Um, so I think it'd be some hybrid forms 
particularly if the health crisis continues, will be there. I do share concerns just briefly that I think uh, Professor Bartlett will do what she's already done, which is dig through now all the millions of homeschooling uh, stories that will be out there and find the worst case scenarios and, and posit those as the norm. Uh, and promote that, never let a good crisis go to waste. She'll have more fodder. However, hopefully, since so many families will have a direct experience with home education, uh, those horror stories will have less of an effect on them. She'll have one real problem with her methodology, which is she's found this one horrific tale that she likes to promote. Um, she's already outgunned by her own university. So if you go to Harvard's website and you their admissions page, on homeschooling, they tell the story of three Harvard homeschoolers um, that are all very positive stories. Sure. Commissioner, do you have anything to add on what you think the, the one positive thing home educators could be doing to help? Um, I do. I think we actually have a gift that we can give to all of these families, and I keep trying to give it away every single day. Um, I think I've even tried to incorporate it into some of the documents that we have made available to our quarantine schoolers is what I refer to them, um, you know, across the state of New Hampshire. Um, and that is really to uh, relax a little bit. Um, our children are uh, inherently curious and, you know, natural learners. Um, as I said at the very beginning of this pivot to remote instruction and support, our kids are gonna learn whether or not we engage in the instruction. The question is, can we engage in that instruction because our kids are learners. And so I think it's just helping um, families to just relax a little bit and recognize that their kids are incredibly, re incredibly resilient, incredibly great learners. Uh, before these kids even show up at school, they've already mastered an oral language most of the time. Um, and so we just have to let that curiosity be encouraged and developed. And I'll give you an exact and real example. Yesterday, I was speaking to a, a father who is home with a second grader. And um, he was describing how he's doing school all day with a second grader. And it's so disruptive to everything he's trying to get done. And I said, you know, if you're spending more than two hours, you're probably too far into this. Just let the kid, you know, have some space and move and, uh, and enjoy. And, uh, and you'll, you'll, the gift that you have is just time with your family and, and time with the ones that you love. So I think that's what we can offer them is uh, the ability to relax about it. Carrie McDonald, one, one positive thing that home yes. educators can do. I, well, I agree with uh, my panelists, but I would also add that I think um, we should challenge this dominant narrative that we are hearing in the media that this time away from school is an educational calamity for children. I mean, the Washington Post headline uh, several weeks ago saying that uh, homeschooling dur during COVID-19 will set back a generation of children. Uh, and I think that instead of focusing on what is lost or what classes or lessons may not be conducted, I think that we should focus on what is gained during this extraordinary moment when parents and children can once again be connected in ways they weren't before, um, maybe linger over breakfast together, enjoy finding out about each other and what are each other's interests, watching documentaries together together, reading books together. Uh, and it's just such an incredible moment and a real historic moment for our children. This will definitely define their childhood and shape their future. And just to acknowledge uh, the impact of this and that we can experience it together as a family, I think is really important. Thank you. And we now are a little bit past time. So I will thank all three of our panelists, Andrew Beckwith, uh, Commissioner Frank Edelblut, and Carrie McDonald for um, sharing your insights and spending part of the afternoon with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next, my colleague Phil Lawler will be back and we will have a presentation by Jamie Gass of the Pioneer Institute. So in any moment, that will begin, I believe. All yours, Phil. Thank you. And 
those of you who have been with us all day, let me recommend all afternoon. I, let me strongly recommend you stay with us. I know it's a long afternoon. If for some reason you have to leave, uh, please come back and watch the end of this presentation. It will be available on YouTube and at the center's the website of the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture. We designed our program to both empower and encourage people who are engaged in homeschooling. And we have been spending up till now mostly on the, uh, the uh, empowering by giving people the background information they need to be politically and rhetorically active. But we're going to end with some encouragement. Uh, the, Jamie Gass is going to give you, I think, uh, some encouragement that you perhaps were not aware of, uh, something that you perhaps were not aware of. We're approaching, we are at a moment where the future of homeschooling, home education, and other forms of educational choice may be blooming for two reasons. One is a negative reason, this epidemic, which is keeping so many people at home and which is altering our approach to education, or looking to alter our approach to education, at least in the near term future. But there's also a positive reason, which is a Supreme Court case that's due to come down in just a matter of weeks, which could really open new doors. I suspect that a whole lot of people, including people who are generally well educated about educational affairs, are not familiar with the Espinoza case. And so we asked Jamie Gass to come to talk to us because he has been intimately involved with that case. Jamie Gass is Pioneer Institute's director of the Center for School Reform. At the Pioneer Institute, he has framed, commissioned, and managed over 100 research papers and numerous policy events on K through 12 education reform topics. Uh, in the 1990s, he worked for the Dean of Boston University School of Education, Boston University Management Team, and its historic partnership with Chelsea Public Schools. His op-eds have been published in New England newspapers, as well as in the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Federalist, the City Journal, et cetera. And I asked uh, Jamie to speak to us this afternoon to close out the conference with an explanation of the Espinoza case and what it could mean for the future of educational choice. Jamie, thank you for being with us today. Great, thanks so much, Phil. I appreciate it. I appreciate your uh, generous uh, introduction. And uh, we at Pioneer are really grateful to uh, you and President Fahey and uh, uh, Thomas Moore College for co-sponsoring this excellent and uh, timely event. Uh, it's an honor to be with you this afternoon, especially with such a distinguished lineup of folks and panelists uh, whom I admire so much. Uh, I, I also want to give a special thanks to Mike Gillerin, who has done so much important work for us at Pioneer in our efforts to support Espinoza v. Montana Department of uh, Revenue. We're so grateful to Mike and uh, Dwight Duncan, who authored two excellent legal briefs for us on what we think is a potentially landmark case uh, against the uh, bigoted legal barriers to school choice. But before I talk more about Espinoza and Blaine amendments, I'd like to say just a couple words about this law professor's uh, frankly bizarre but not unsurprising comments about homeschooling. Uh, I'll, uh, as I'll discuss, uh, narrow-minded opposition to school choice sadly has deep bigoted roots in the 19th century and across American history. Uh, this professor, to my mind, has simply said and given more modern voice to what I think a lot of people who have observed K-12 education for decades uh, have also uh, observed, which is unmistakably many across the K-12 education system believe that they know better than parents themselves, the parents themselves, what's best for their children. The reality is too many in public education oppose or have outright hostility to almost all forms of school choice, including private and religious school, charter schools, vocational technical schools, and many even oppose a key educational option for the moment, online or digital learning. 
But homeschooling as Pioneer's 2017 white paper by Bill Hewer says is the ultimate choice. This should be, and it is uh, right that it should be that way because the fundamental duty of parents to order and direct the formative education of their children is in fact sacred. As an aside, I thought it was a little bit uh, unusual that there would be such a strident um, criticism of homeschooling when in fact over the last uh, several months we've gotten uh, new data from NAEP, the nation's report card. It's administered every couple of years. It's a sample test, goes back 35 or 40 years. And the data was really pretty um, disturbing. The reality of it is we live in a country where two thirds of the students are not reading at grade level. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was additional NAEP data that revealed that only a quarter of the students in this uh, country are uh, proficient in civics. So in the key areas of both literacy and civic knowledge, I think many people believe that the K-12 public system has a great deal to answer for. Um, but at Pioneer Institute where I work, it's a small think tank in Boston and going back 30 years, we've done lots of work on school choice and all kinds of papers and events on academic qualities. I've always been particularly grateful for the work that the people in the homeschooling community have done uh, as well as people in religious schooling community as well. We fought the common core standards uh, that have been implemented over the last 10 years. And we went to you know, approximately 20 states when we did that. And I gotta tell you, when we were in with those audiences, I'd say a full third of those parents who are deeply engaged, knowledgeable, in some instances more knowledgeable than policymakers, uh, were the backbone of that opposition. And we now know from da NAEP data that in fact, <clears throat> the Common Core has done some pretty significant damage, not only uh, nationally, but in high performing states like uh, Massachusetts. Uh, now Massachusetts, my home state, uh, has a great deal to be proud of. Its public system has engaged in pretty dramatic and I think historic reforms over the last 25 years or so. Uh, we had remarkable success on the NAEP, uh, been the number one state in, on NAEP going back to 2005. We're the only state that's internationally competitive. We have great charter schools. We have great Voc Tech schools that are both national models, uh, as well as METCO and uh, a growing number of, uh, of homeschooling students. Uh, and we're really proud of those accomplishments. But I want to highlight just one school choice option that is uh, germane to the conversation we're having about Espinoza and to Blaine amendments and the various barriers to private and parochial school choice and, as well as homeschooling. Um, Massachusetts is home to the best Catholic schools in the United States. The couple of measures that we have in common demonstrate that the Catholic schools, which if aggregated would actually be the largest school district in Massachusetts. Uh, and the measures we have in common significantly outperformed the Commonwealth. And that's saying a great deal because again, Massachusetts has done historically well in terms of, of its academic achievement over the last 25 years. But the Catholic schools are really struggling and with their enrollment and they're, they're struggling not as much out of their own uh, fault as it is um, something that Massachusetts should not be very proud of, which are Blaine amendments. These are bigoted 19th century anti-Catholic um, legal barriers to private and parochial school choice. And in fact, Massachusetts uh, has among the worst and, and among the oldest in the country. And they're so bad and early that they were established before the Civil War by the uh, uh, violently anti-Catholic Know Nothing Party. At this point, there are 38 states uh, that have these Blaine minutes, including Blaine amendments, including Montana, the home of Kendra Espinoza, a single mom, two daughters, Naomi and Sarah. She's the lead plaintiff in Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue, which is, uh, was heard before the US Supreme Court in January, and we should be hearing their final decision anytime soon um, this spring. I always say to people internally uh, at Pioneer that this topic of school choice and Blaine amendments really is the most interesting topic we work on. We do a lot of great work around academic standards and teaching history and civics and science and 
but it really is it's the most interesting. And the reason why is, is that it has this unique combination of education and law and uh, religion and politics and history. Uh, and so in order to kind of um, familiarize people with the vocabulary and some of the historical touchstones uh, around this case, uh, and to actually to kind of help put in context, the, uh, from my point of view, the, co the comments from this law professor, uh, I, I wanna just give you some of these touchstones. So uh, it was, it's been mentioned sort of variously uh, uh, throughout the, this uh, seminar uh, that a lot of our you know, original ideas about education go back to the founders. Uh, and folks like John Adams and George um, Mason and Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton were men of the enlightenment. They built our laws upon the natural law and reason and science and not just respect for religious tolerance, but religious liberty, full-throated religious liberty. Uh, in many ways, um, they were much more open-minded than we, our society is today about issues of church of state. And the reality of it is, is that uh, early state constitutions like the Massachusetts Constitution and the New Hampshire Constitution, they predate the federal constitution, which is virtually silent on K-12 education reform. But these state constitutions were quite specific. And simply put, it was the intent of early America to keep education as close to parents and local communities as possible. And, le and in fact, in many instances, legally sanctioning public support for religious instruction by parents. I think they th saw it as a kind of free market of educational options. George Washington in his 1796 farewell address made clear the connection between self-government and religion. And he described our constitutions as designed to perpetuate what he described as the sacred fire of liberty. Again, there probably isn't anything that's more sacred to parents than the education of their children. But this uh, kind of more tolerant view of civil society really began to give way in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s to religious intolerance, uh, primarily as uh, Irish immigrants fled the potato famine and arrived in, uh, into Northeast cities, including Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And, and with them uh, became this nativist uh, impulse to begin to wall off the educational uh, options and uh, freedom from parents uh, and local uh, religious uh, folks. Um, and in 1854, and I'll just speak to my state here in Massachusetts, again, the, the violently anti-Catholic Know Nothing Party won the biggest landslide in state electoral history. They were led by their governor, Henry Gardner, who incidentally, his portrait is uh, right next to the main entrance of the House of Representatives in Massachusetts still today. But he and his party passed a wide swath of appallingly anti-Catholic um, bigoted uh, amendments. In fact, the, their, their proto-Blaine amendment um, really set out to undo what it was the, that the original, the founders intended, uh, which was having the money flow more freely back and forth between parent, between the public and parents and religious instruction. Uh, and then a second uh, Blaine Amendment was passed in 1917, which prevents that first anti-aid amendment or the Know Nothing Amendment from being repealed via the ballot box. It's a kind of legal protective coding around it. Well, if you fast forward about 30 years to the 1880s, James G. Blaine of Maine, he was a prominent Republican politician of the late 19th century. He and President Ulysses S. Grant stoked anti-Catholic sentiments and pressed for a national Blaine Amendment, which would uh, again, uh, wall off parents uh, from public dollars, particularly Catholic school parents from religious dollars. Now that, that narrowly was defeated in the uh, US Senate, uh, but where Blaine uh, failed, the states began to pick up this torch of gra uh, and, throughout, and gradually throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, we arrived where we are now, which is, you know, 38 states have these, these Blaine amendments. And that brings us to uh, Kendra Espinoza. So Kendra, uh, as I mentioned, is a uh, single mom from Montana and her state uh, has a Blaine amendment. Uh, she and her, her daughters uh, in conjunction with the Institute for Justice 
uh, have brought their case uh, in Montana uh, to first their state Supreme Court, uh, but they've taken all the way to the US Supreme Court. So Kendra suddenly became a single mother and she saw better educational options for her daughters out uh, because the reality of it is that they were being both bullied and they were struggling academically in the public school system. They, they through an educational tax credit program that is, was passed by the state legislature and signed into law by their governor, was able, they were, their children were able to thrive going to a parochial school. Uh, but then the Department of Revenue uh, challenged the existence of this program, this education tax credit program. Uh, and just sort of simply what an education tax credit program is, is that it allows individuals and corporations to make uh, a, a contribution to a third party uh, entity. They get a tax credit for that. Then the third party entity disperses that money to parents who are able to uh, use those resources for the educational option of their choosing. Uh, and about uh, 250,000 students or more benefit from, from these kinds of programs uh, across the country. But the Montana Supreme Court struck down the Montana uh, Education Tax Credit Program uh, that, that Kendra and uh, other parents in Montana needed very uh, badly. Uh, and now this question is in front of the Supreme Court. And so the central question here is at stake is you know, whether states will continue to be allowed to use bigoted 19th century Blaine amendments to discriminate against, discriminate against religious families and deny them a state service or benefit, in this instance, education. <clears throat> now, I will say that determining what it is that the Supreme Court is going to do or, or how they're going to rule is a bit like analyzing Mona Lisa's smile. Uh, but the lawyers at the Institute for Justice and Kendra, I think, are cautiously optimistic that they're going to prevail. And this would be uh, very much a landmark, landmark decision if they rule the, hope, the way we hope they will. That is to say, it will rip holes in these state of blame amendments that will make it possible not only for education tax credits, but then it really opens up a wider uh, state of play for the political process and uh, to, to play itself out. And this is where it's really so important and vital, uh, the work that you folks are doing because uh, that the, these kinds of openings, these legal openings will then make it possible for greater access if state legislators avail themselves to it, uh, education savings ac accounts and other tax credit programs and support of of private and, and religious school parents uh, through a variety of other different choice mechanism. Uh, and this is vitally important because uh, as we've just learned with this article from this law professor, um, uh, there is bias and bigotry, whether it is 19th century style bias and bigotry that you find through Blaine amendments or bias and bigotry that you find through intemperate remarks from uh, uh, well-placed law professors. Um, and, you know, our hope obviously is, is that with the success of the hopeful success of the Supreme Court, that parents will be allowed to explore even greater opportunities to educate their children uh, according to what Thomas Jefferson called the dictates of their conscience. So I can't tell you how grateful I am to Thomas Moore for all of your excellent work on this topic. Uh, I'm very grateful for all the work that the homeschooling community has done uh, around the support and advocacy of their own schools, but also for their work that they've done supporting the academic improvement of the public schools and other school choice mechanisms uh, by giving us such a good example of the work that they do. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, I'm currently unable to see the screen, I've done something with my computer, but thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a reflection and I'm grateful for one point that you made that the founders and the original uh, crafters of educational policy, particularly in Massachusetts, did so with a firm understanding that they were working to empower parents, to give parents more resources with which to fulfill their responsibility. Now, if 
if we are successful, if Kendra is successful, Kendra Espinosa is successful, then parents will have more resources, access should have more resources in the form of state support in various ways. But I think it's also worth reflecting on the fact that if the Supreme Court essentially gives the green light to strike down these Blaine amendments, we all also will have erased something that defaced the original intent of the founders. So that philosophically, we would be back to the original educational goal, which is to empower parents. Am I overstating the case? No, I think that's exactly right. Again, you know, in so many regards, I think the founders got a lot of these uh, state, uh, uh, local, federal arrangements uh, right. And, uh, you know, I think what we've seen over the last 25 or 30 years at least has been a dramatic uh, shift, not only away from state and local authority, but towards federal authority. Yes. And, you know, I think that the, the there has been, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of concern and a lot of people have voiced uh, strong opposition to that. Uh, but even given the opinions of the people that are proponents of that, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the, the NAEP scores, the nation's report card, the measure of academic performance has really been either flatlined or declining for, for decades. It, the, this huge movement towards the federal role uh, or even a more consolidated state role, uh, it hasn't yielded any results. And I, I think that, that, again, the onus is really on these proponents to explain why we keep spending hundreds of billions of dollars at the federal level, and in some instances, you know, tens of billions of dollars at the state level, when in fact, we're just migrating the authority further and further away from the, the, the family and the parents, the ones that are most intimately connected with the lives and concerns and intellectual well-being of their kids. And the founders, I think, were very wise about these things. They did not, uh, the state constitutions are clear about it. The federal constitution is silent on it. And even at this late date, the, the federal government contributes about 10% of the funding of K-12 education, which is really a very modest amount. Uh, and in most states, or in many states, it's still largely locally funded. So um, I, I think that the founders got it right. And I think that, you know, uh, hopefully with this decision, we can begin to uh, begin to right the ship in terms of getting the, the, the authority back into the hands of the people that are most intimately commit, connected with their school children. And the best guess for when the decision will come out is in June? May or June, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I mean, again, it's, uh, it, it, but it could be any day. I mean, we have pretty close contact with the Institute for Justice who incidentally have done tremendous work on this, on this topic and both they and Kendra have been remarkably uh, courageous. Uh, and and she, she is a, a really a terrific woman. We had her pioneer at her at a couple events this past fall. She's really a terrific person to interact with. She brought her, her children here. And uh, so I think everyone is uh, waiting with uh, fingers crossed. Thank you, Jamie Gass, for giving us some good news to close with. Uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to all the panelists. Uh, thank you to Amy Fahey for having the idea for this conference, to Mike Gillerin for helping to make it happen in many ways, to William Fahey for agreeing to host and of course, to all the people who are out there watching this and uh, making it happen and all who will be watching it later on YouTube, it will remain on YouTube. Uh, so pass the word to your friends and neighbors. If this is your first acquaintance with Thomas More College, I strongly recommend that you learn more, particularly if you're a homeschooler, because I think you might find that we're an institution with the same blood type. If this is your first acquaintance with our Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture, please get on our mailing list and learn more about events like this. It's unusual for us to do, be doing it on uh, the internet. Usually we do it in a more intimate setting, but if uh, this is as successful as I think it may, have, may be, we'll probably be doing more. Thank you all and good evening.